Good evening. This is December 11th, uh, 2017, and the regular board meeting of District 64 Board of Education. Uh, due to the inclement weather, Tom is not here yet, but I'll take the roll. Uh, Larry Rawls? Here. Tony Borelli is here. Rick Biaggi? Here. And Eastman? Here. Okay. Uh, we fully expect other members to arrive momentarily, as I said. We have some inclement weather tonight. We start the night by a recommendation of a closed session to discuss recently concluded first mediation session of the SSC negotiations under 5 Illinois Compile Statute 122C2 and a discussion under 5 Illinois Compile Statute 122C5 regarding the purchase of real estate and a final point under 122C10 special education program and its students. Uh, I've made the motion. I'll need a second. Second. Rick has provided the second. We need an oral vote, so Eastman? Yes. Rick? Yes. 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 Okay, we'll go into closed. Hello, everybody. The board is back from closed session. We're running a little late, sorry about that. Um, I would uh, first like to go to the board, and because we have our students here, and rather than holding the levy before the students, I'd like to expedite that. So uh, is the board in favor of altering slightly the agenda and allowing the students to come first? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay? yes please. Very good. So tonight we have the uh, uh, Emerson Chamber Orchestra group led by Ms. Fall Haber. Did I say that right? Yeah. All right. Um, and and uh, we're, we're waiting uh, for the wonderful time of the year for the wonderful music. So please.
two pieces will be a holiday coat crown and then how fitting for let it snow.
Thank you so much, Mrs. Fallhaber, and to the Emerson Orchestra. You sounded fantastic. Thanks for coming out in this inclement weather evening and helping kick off our board meeting in such a lovely way. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. These are our CSO representatives here. That was that was wonderful. That was great. Very talented. It was wonderful. Wait till we clear out a little bit. We should start all our meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It really gets you like get your spirits going. Like, Just another minute. Okay, the board is obviously back from closed session. And before we get started, we have a couple of new members. So Tom, can you repeat the roll, please? Yes. Eastman too. Here. Mark Eggerman. Here. Rick Biaggi. Here. Anthony Borelli. Here. Tom Soto's here. Uh, Larry Riles stepped out for a moment. He'll be back. And Fred Sanchez. Here. Okay, uh, the board has recently concluded a closed session where it discussed the current special education program. Well, actually, we skipped that. It will be done in open session. Potential real estate project for the district and a mediation session with the SSC. Before we begin our agenda, a few notes. On November 28th, the district negotiating team had its first mediation session with the SSC group. Some items were tentatively reached, but more is to be done. The board has an updated. Uh, the board has been updated tonight, and going forward, has provided direction and a framework to the negotiation team. Next meeting of the two groups will be on January 8th. Next board meeting will be a busy one and held on January 22nd here at Jefferson. Tonight, we present the public hearing on the tax levy and hold its voting, and we'll turn to that now. Levy process was first discussed in open session on September 25th. The public forum was held on September 28th. Board discussion and open session continued on October 10th, October 23rd, and November 13th. A short recap of specifics can be found on Appendix 1 from the October 10th meeting. Due to lengthy discussion on this issue over the past two months, this public hearing is held later than normal. We normally have the hearing on a separate date than the vote. However, due to the extensive discussions in open session in public forum, uh, the uh, uh, board has uh, decided that due to the time constraints, we'll be having the, the um, um, uh, discussion and the voting on the same night tonight. So I will move forward to the levy. The uh, tax district must explain the reasons for its levy and proposed increase. Anyone who wants uh, may present testimony and, and given the opportunity to do so. And after the hearing, taxing district may adopt the tax levy. So the adoption of the 2017 tax levy is a culmination of work that's been done by the administration since 2017 CPIU of 2.1% was known in January 2017. Once the CPIU was known, the board's assumptions, financial projections were updated in February 2017. Administration began putting together the 2017-18 budget and the five-year financial projections, beginning with future enrollment and staffing needs for the upcoming school year. At the October 10th, 2017, October 23rd, 2017, November 13th, 2017, Board of Education meetings, administration reviewed with the board the tax levy process for the district, including the implications for future financial projections. At the November 13th, 2017 meeting, board was polled regarding the loss and cost added onto the operating funds and debt service funds. The board directed the administration to keep the lost and cost on all funds this year, including debt service. 
says, additional information regarding the board's approach to loss and cost going forward can be found in the minutes from the November 13th, 2017 Board of Education meeting and the board report prepared tonight for the tax levy adoption. The 2017 tax levy request has been set higher than the CPIU of 2.1% so that the district may capture all legally entitled funds generated from new construction within the school district borders. Cook County Clerk will make the legally required adjustments to the district's tax levy before issuing the tax levy extension in the late spring of 2018. Funds received from the tax levy accounts for 85% of the total revenue the district anticipates receiving each fiscal year. The funds received from the 2017 tax levy will be expended over the course of the 2017, 18, and 18, 19 fiscal years. The tax levy funds received are used to pay salaries, benefits including legally required payments to Social, Social Security, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, Medicare, and the teacher retirement system. Operational costs including transportation of students and maintenance of our facilities and repayment of outstanding bond payments. As I go to the public, I'll first go to the board and I'll, uh, I'll give a motion of opening the levy for the 2017-18 year. Is there a second? Second. And uh, just, just, we'll take a vote. Yes. 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 Okay, at this time, I go to the public and if anyone would like to provide testimony to the board on the 2017 tax levy, Please approach the podium. Going once, going twice, and not seeing anyone, um, thank you very much. Is there any board comments on the levy? And not hearing any, I will therefore officially close the levy process for the 2017-2018 school year. Thank you. As we do for all of our meetings, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Normally I ask Larry Riles, uh, a member of the um, Army uh, Hall of Fame actually, to uh, lead us. Uh, but tonight I, I uh, encourage all of us to stand and re recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up on our agenda would be public comments. And normally we ask for folks to provide public comments on items not on the agenda. If there are going to be public comments on the special ed um, placement update or, or at that time, I would uh, encourage you to wait and we can have our discussion and those comments provided at the same time. It would kind of make more sense to have all of that uh, together. So if there's any, anybody who would like to make public comment on the, anything on, not on the agenda, please come forward. Hello. Hi. Just state my, your name, please. My name is Michael Hendricks. I'm a homeowner here in Park Ridge. Um, got a few notes. I actually attended District 64 schools from kindergarten in 1958 to through eighth grade in 1967. And I'm probably one of the few people here who can remember when Oakton was a two-lane street. <laughs> My comments are about property taxes. And uh, very quickly, my background, I had 40 years in the, not, in the private sector, non-union employee, no pension, uh, no protections, employment at will at all times. And I recently read that in the state of Illinois, the median property tax on residential property is 2.67%. In the state of Indiana, it's 0.88%. So the state of Illinois median property tax is triple that of Indiana. And it's one of the highest, if not the highest, in the nation. Yes, it is. In spite of 
a triple property tax um, plus the recent 4.95% uh, uh, in, uh, income tax rate, we have $130 billion in unfunded pension liabilities. So my point as a, you know, my parents, they're deceased now, but they've been paying taxes since World War II and then I took over when they died. But the taxes are too high. And I don't think enough is being done to cut costs. It's just in my lifetime here in Illinois, I've seen the culture change where the average person with just a mediocre or average education is better off working in the public sector than the private sector. It didn't used to be that way uh, 40 or 50 years ago. So I urge the board to do more to cut costs towards the state average, which I believe is uh, $12,821 per student. <coughs> I urge the board to not let the superintendent uh, tell you that this district pays such and such and we have to pay more and all that, but rather look at the assessed value per student. And because we're so residential in Park Ridge or District 64, we all know that other districts have a much higher assessed value per student. And as such, the, I hope the board asks every meeting, not what other districts pay their teachers, but what can we afford? I'm almost done. I recently read that per the IRS in 2015, 84,000 people left the state of Illinois, including 40,000 taxpayers. And that is a bad sign. I can't tell you how many people in my generation, after their kids got done with school and they retired, left the state. Because in, partly is the weather, which can't be changed, but part of it is property taxes. So I urge the board to move the district in the future towards the state average of $12,821 per student. And I appreciate your time and thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else? And not seeing any, we'll move right along. Uh, do you want to get right into Brian's All right, we'll do that. So, uh, next item is report and acceptance of the annual audit fiscal year 17 uh, by Brian Imhoff. Brian, turn on your microphone. And for the board members, this begins on page 9. An action item is noted on page 10 of the board packets. Okay. You're on. You're on. Okay. Okay, tonight I'm presenting to the board for acceptance the reports associated with our annual audit for the year ending June 30, 2017. The deliverables that are included within your board packet are a set of audited financial statements, the annual financial report that goes to the state of Illinois, along with a set of communication letters written by the auditors. As you know, all public school districts in Illinois are required to have an audit performed each year, and that audit has to be done by an independent external auditing firm. So this year, District 64's audit was completed by Klein Hall, a CPA firm based in Naperville. There are three main objectives in every school district audit. The one we're all most familiar with is the auditors coming in and examining our year-end account balances to look for possible errors or omissions in the financial statements. However, there are also two other objectives. They will look at our financial processes for possible risks or inefficiencies. And third, they review our federal grant programs to ensure that we're complying with all rules and regulations of those grants. So how do the auditors communicate their results? They, they do it in two different ways. The first is through their audit opinion, which is a report located within our financial statements. 
of the 80 plus pages that make up the financial statements, the three page audit opinion is, is the only section that is written by the auditors themselves. So that's typically where users of our financial statements will look at first. This year, as in years past, District 64 was issued an unqualified audit opinion. This is essentially the auditor's way of saying that our numbers are materially correct and fairly represent the district's financial condition. Now the audit opinion is a, a boilerplate type of document, so it doesn't change a whole lot from year to year and it doesn't go into much detail. For example, what's not included in the audit opinion, but is definitely worth mentioning tonight, is that there were no adjustments proposed by the auditors to our year-end balances this year. This is one of the primary goals of the business office each year. The fact that we had no audit adjustments serves as a validation for us that we are maintaining and providing accurate financial data to the board and to the community so that people can understand how we are spending our tax dollars each year. The second set of audit results comes in the form of the communication letters I referenced earlier. The communication letters are a set of standalone documents that describe audit findings and audit recommendations in more detail. Audit findings are deficiencies that warrant reporting to the state of Illinois, whereas audit recommendations are less severe and are for the district's internal consideration only. This is the seventh year in a row that we have had no audit findings reported to the state. Furthermore, for the first time in well over a decade, we had no audit recommendations either this year. So this year's communication letters were completely clean in both areas. So I'm obviously thrilled to be able to share such good news with the, the board this evening. I'll just wrap up by saying a lot goes into the audit process each year. There are several people that are involved in um, preparing for the audit both through their daily job responsibilities as well as taking the time to pull information or answer questions for the auditors when they're actually on site. So it really is a team effort. I just wanted to publicly thank all of those individuals and um, say how much we appreciate their work that went into making these results possible. So I'll entertain any questions the board has. Does the board have any questions of uh, Brian on this issue? I've got just one quick question. Please. Um, what's the process that we take each year to select the audit firm? Do we go out to bid each year? Do we, we have a contract for a couple of years? How does that work? Right now we're on a year-to-year -year contract, so it's up for renewal each year. We're not locked into any type of contract. We've been with this firm for seven years now. Initially it was a three-year contract that we did with the main township schools as a cohort. And then each year after that, we've renewed it one year at a time. So this is so this is the same firm this, that 207 uses. Yeah. Not not 207, but the other elementary districts. Oh, I'm sorry. 63, yeah. okay. 62. Right, right. And our treasurer. And the treasurer's office. Okay. And so, do we put this out to bid? We or? can. Okay. It's a um, RF. RFQ, right? It's done through an RFP. If we were to to go out and solicit a new auditor. Um, right now the cost is slightly over 25000 so it does come to the board each year for approval. But if we wanted to go through the process of vetting audit firms, we would do it through an RFP process. Okay. So just to take that one step further as long as we're going to have the discussion, um, it's, it's possible that that amount of money that we're being charged for the audit is pretty standard, I would imagine. Is that correct? It's pretty typical. It depends on size. multiple factors, yes, yeah. but size um, is one of them. Should we go out to bid and we have a new auditor to come in, would there be more work for your department getting used to new auditors? Would they do a different system? Uh, how would that impact the business department? There's typically a little bit more work the first year just as the new audit firm is learning how we do things and how we, the documents we provide for them. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it doesn't change a whole lot. They may have slightly different areas that they focus on right. in comparison to another firm or slightly different tests and procedures they're performing, mm -hmm. but the, the end result will end up being the same in types of the documents produced and, and the minimum requirements that they have to perform. And these are totally independent f firms, right? They Correct. have no affiliation with the district. Correct. They're not allowed to. Right. So, so other than that first year of hiccup, 
um, you, you've kind of fallen into a pattern and you, and you follow that out. So obviously you wouldn't want to be changing firms every year. I imagine that would lead to a lot of extra work, right? It could, yes. Yeah. Okay. More, so, more so time on the auditor's part probably, which could increase cost. Sometimes the cost is a little bit higher the first year and then the, as they have their system in place, they will actually hold it the same or bring it down in some cases. So after seven years, do you find that it's become somewhat perfunctory and that perhaps the, the auditor we should change auditors to get a better audit performed, or is it going to be the same regardless? Um, it's, a, it's a valid question. You, there is benefit to having a new set of eyes look at it every so often. Um, each audit firm tends to rotate the staff they have on the job every couple of years just so that they have a fresh look at things. Um, generally, what I've seen, districts have gone out because either they're not happy with the relationship, or they're looking for a better price. Okay. So Rick, do you have any thoughts on what you'd like to have? It's more of a perception thing, I think, than anything else. That not, not that I'm <coughs> suggesting their objectivity should be brought into question, but after a while you could imagine a situation where as long as they keep giving us good results, we'll keep hiring them. Right. Um, and so it's just purely an optics perspective uh, that I'm looking at it from. I don't think, having done this for eight years at the Park District, I know that there wasn't a huge lot of difference in cost amongst the firms, but just purely second set of eyes and objectivity, I think, is something good to yeah. consider. And, and normally, I mean, how long did we have the previous firm for? Are you familiar with that at all? Um, I don't know offhand, but it, it was a while as well. So it would be prudent then to have a, a figure, perhaps 10 years, 8 years, something like that, to where we move around. I mean, it sounds like there's going to be several players, big players in the field, right? And it's sure. the same people move around. Yeah, so 15 years from now, we may very well wind up with the same group. That's possible. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't have any problem getting responses if we were to put out an RFB. It's a pretty competitive market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, if you can keep that in the back of your head, uh, that uh, next year or two that we ought to go out for a bid on, on a, new, a new group. Is that okay with the rest of the board, Fred? Yes. yes. Guys? So okay. for 17, 18, we'll continue with Klein Hall, and then 18, 19, we'll go out for RFP. That'd be okay with me. Is that what year. you're saying? Good. Okay. 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 There is a, this is an action item. I'd take a motion on this, please. Section item 17-12-1. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge Niles, Illinois, accept the annual audit report as presented for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2017. Second. 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 Eastman's got the second, starting with Fred. Yes. 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 Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Brian. My congratulations Brian. to the business department. I was just going to say again, congratulations Great. on seven consecutive years of such a stellar report. Nice work. Thank you. Thanks. The next item is the tax levy resolution, number 1193, on page 149, with an action item on page 150. Luann? Thanks, Tony. Uh, so this being the first time some of our board members have gone through the tax levy, um, I kind of laid out the different steps that are required uh, to go through the levy, and then basically what's included in the levy packet tonight that you're uh, proving um, in terms of what we'll be submitting to the um, county clerk's office by December 26th. Does anyone have any specific questions? Other than the loss and cost issue, I know we talked mm -hmm. about that at length at the last meeting, and I know we kind of separated it out mm -hmm. from the levy itself. So I think we were, there was board consensus. We're going to look at some things with loss and cost, but that doesn't necessarily impact what we're doing tonight on the levy. Correct. And the second paragraph here, it kind of talks about what you guys have directed us, and I'm assuming that I got that all correct and what you want. Right. Do you want to reiterate? Uh, so what the board has... small to, summary. Yeah, just for, small at the November meeting is that uh, 
once the uh, we can move forward with the capital projects financial framework which is using the fund balance in the debt service fund to pay off current debt we will maintain a $250,000 balance in the debt service fund to cover potential issues with future levies. If the balance is at 250 or more, the board can direct the administration to prepare a resolution to have Cook County reduce the loss and cost by a certain percentage for that tax levy year. And basically the policy committee will work to put this into policy so that future boards and administrations will understand the decision that was made regarding loss and costs. So what, to everybody, uh, loss and cost is um, not everybody pays their taxes. So there's a difference between the what we levy and what we expect at 100% and what is actually collected. So Cook County automatically adds taxes onto your taxes so that we will recoup a full 100%, but it actually turns out to be slightly over 100%. So what this board is suggesting is that we're gonna keep a small amount in a trust fund in case Cook County has an issue with collection of their taxes. But anything above that uh, trust fund, we're telling Cook County we don't want it. We don't want to take any more of your money. We are trying to be as true as we can to the taxpayers in this district by telling Cook County, keep it, put it someplace else, do, do whatever you do with your money, but we don't need more of our taxpayers' money. And this, this really was brought to light by Vice President Biaggi. And I appreciate your thoughts and, and uh, helping the taxpayers. And it, once we understood it, it, it was summarily, uh, uniformly agreed to by the board. So um, to the individual who spoke before, we are trying every which way possible to control costs to the taxpayers. Um, any other questions or comments on the levy? Fred, anything? No. Okay. This is an action item on page uh, 150. All right. I can All right. Great. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge Niles, Illinois, <coughs> adopt the attached resolution number 1193 providing for a levy of taxes for the year 2017. Resolution number 1194 instruct the county clerk how to apportion 2017 tax levy extension reductions. And resolution number 1195 authorizing tax for Illinois municipal retirement purposes. These resolutions and supporting documentation will be filed with the Cook County Clerk's Office. Is there a second? Second. Second. Fred's got it. Starting with Eastman. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I can imagine what most folks are here for. If I can just bear your indulgence for a little longer. The uh, water testing update. Beginning on page 161, we have a report on water testing in the district provided by Ms. Colstad and Ron is... Uh, Ron to George. <laughs> Uh, I can start and I'll have Ron fill in then. Uh, Senate Bill 0550 was signed by Governor Rauner on January 16, 2017, and this law requires all school districts in Illinois to complete water testing at all pre K 5 sites within your district. And for us, it's all of our buildings were built before January 1, 1987. Um, th these are water sources that are accessible to students, faculty, and staff for cooking and or drinking. Uh, this year we went beyond those guidelines and also did our two middle schools as well of an, as a number of non-required drinking water and or potable water sources within the school uh, buildings. We had sent out a uh, letter to basically all of the parents within the district using school messenger about the um, lead testing results and we have them by school posted on our website now. Uh, individuals can go there and um, look at what the test results were for their different schools. Um, I'm going to have Ron kind of tell you what we're doing right now with the fixtures um, that were identified as having levels above what IDP, Illinois Department of Public Health, finds accept acceptable. There's, excuse me, there's really three standards that the state or that the federal government is using in conjunction with the state. Um, federal guidelines say uh, 15 parts per billion or above is considered hazardous. 
Uh, the state of Illinois took that a step farther for schools and said that they wanted everything tested, um, any sources of potable water, meaning drinking water, to be tested um, and identified anything with two parts per billion or, or more. Um, the, the sources that were two to five or under five um, just need to be monitored, flushed, and with an attempt made to remediate and retest. No immediate action to shut down the source or anything is, is mandated if it's under five. Once it reaches five or above, the state wants you to shut that source down, find what the problem is and remediate and repair or leave it disconnected or post that it is not um, drinking water, the hand wash station only type of thing. So um, what we did when we got the results, um, we had a few sources that were over five, so the district uh, plumber went out and we shut those down. Um, and, and actually, all, all of the ones that came in, even over two, we have d decided as a, as a district that we're going to start replacing fixtures at those locations and some of the plumbing and valves that typically are the source of, of the lead from, from just the old manufacturing process. Uh, we, uh, about a year and a half ago, we did a test of, for lead everywhere in the district for incoming water and water sources and that's when we went around and put in the filtered drinking water and, and um, filtered uh, spouts in the teachers lounges so that we, we do have sources of filtered potable drinking water for everybody at every building. Uh, so going forward right now, like I was saying, we, we are in the process of changing out fixtures, faucets, valves, and some supply lines leading to these areas. And once, once that work is complete, um, United Analytical, um, our environmentalist, will be back to retest those sources. Any questions or concerns? Um, what, just one question. How, how can an old fixture, uh, these are non-lead fixtures, so how, how, where's the lead come from? A lot of the old fixtures weren't non-lead. Was that right? No. They, you know, they were soldered together before, before they decided oh, lead to take lead out of the solder. Yeah. There used to be a 50-50 uh, lead and tin mix in solder. Mm -hmm. um, now they, they've, they've gone more with... Uh, it's take, you know they're taking all of that out. They went to 50-50 to to 70-30 to 95-5, and now they've eliminated lead completely out of the solder that they're using, and they've even taken it a step farther that um uh, they've gone to the to the pro clamp devices that you don't even solder anymore. It just crimps it into place. So, uh, but a, a lot of the old faucets were zinc zinc coated. You know, instead of chrome, mm -hmm. they were zinc plated. Um, they were soldered into place and things like that. So that's where we're starting to eliminate that and and flush out all of the old the old pipes that are going to some of those areas still. When you estimate this work will be completed, um, the faucets are on order. All the parts are on order. I'm, we're hoping to get them to, for them to start coming in, and we should be. I would think that we should be able to finish it up within a month. We're doing it in-house instead of uh, subcontracting it, so we've got one, one plumber in the district. And, you know, um, barring any, anything drastic that happens, you know, other than just a leaky faucet or, or um, overflowing toilet or something like that, he, he's able to dedicate pretty much time to it. Okay, any other comments by the board? Thanks, Ron. All right, I direct myself to the next item on the agenda, the special education placement update, beginning on page 64 in our packets. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments first. Many functions of the board are found in board policy. One of the main functions is to hire the superintendent. 
and director of duties through policy. Day-to-day -day running of the district is through the superintendent as policy 2 colon 130 clearly dictates. In many areas, most notably education, the board listens and relies upon administration to guide us. At our last meeting, the board heard from some impacted families regarding a potential change for their children in the student services area. Some of the voice concerns were the following. Decisions being made outside of the IEP process, loss of social contacts from moved students, added stress to the impacted students uh, due to further movement and potential stress with incorporation and new groups, changes were occurring only due to costs, and finally, families not being told of this potential change. The board heard these comments for the first time with interest. The entire video contents of that meeting and specific discussion can be found on the district website. I reviewed the video of the last meeting several times. Clearly stated at that meeting was that the board would have a report by Dr. Heinz for tonight to help the board understand the full extent of the issue as the board was unaware of any specific changes to our special ed groups. There was also a two article report in last week's edition of the Herald Advocate for which I'm now in part reacting to. At the very least, what I found needed clarification. It was noted in the article that I stated that the board would review the matter in closed session due to student involvement, yet noted that at 10 p.m. in quote unquote, long after parents had left. The board spoke to Jane Boyd, written to suggest as if we were excluding the parents. The reality is I did not realize that Jane Boyd had not only submitted her resignation, but that her departure was imminent and she would not be available for further board discussion at a later date. Therefore, in the best interest of public communication, I felt it best to have what could be said, stated by Jane, and recorded for the public on the web rather than lose that opportunity for the future. We have every opportunity to hear further parental comments tonight. I and the board avoid no topic nor person and encourage the community to approach the board at all times. The timing of the discussion was that it was due to the fact that this was all occurring at the moment during a live meeting. Reality is that regardless of the time of the discussion, the fact that the discussion occurred at all in an open session, along with the promise of further follow-up at the very next meeting, should be the takeaway. There was also mention of a supposed comment by Dr. Heinz regarding board function. I personally reviewed the video several times and did not hear any exclam exclamation as to what the board could or could not do. The board serves the important function of checks and balances to the operation. Board has every right and opportunity to review operations with the superintendent. As a matter of fact, we're doing that right now. What the board cannot do is interfere with the IE process or its decisions. Further, following policy 8 colon 130, community members are asked to direct concerns to the appropriate level of authority within the district. Folks can certainly approach the board on issues, but as it may center on operations, oftentimes they may be referred back to administration. Due to Jane Boyd's departure from this district and the timing of this issue, the board is participating at a time when family discussions with the district and IEP deliberations are still occurring for what in, in the end is and will be the best possible programming and outcomes for the children. Participation in those tasks is not what the board does. Our skills do not lie in that area and rightfully our trained administration has that responsibility. Our job therefore will be to see that all zones are overturned, IEPs fully conducted and participated in, making certain that all options and resources are made available now and for the future without the overt consideration of cost and the ultimate program chosen appropriately for our children. And for the latest update, I now turn to Dr. Heinz. Thank you, Dr. Borelli. Uh, so as you said, on November 13th, a number of parents addressed the board during public comment regarding their concerns about several current fourth graders that were potentially going to be transitioning to middle school one year early, beginning in August of 2018. And yes, thank you, Mrs. Frake, I forgot to invite you up. This is our assistant director of SPED, who's, who's doing a lot of extra work since Ms. Boyd's departure. Uh, and she'll be chiming in as I uh, give you an update in terms of my, my findings over the last month. 
Um, as Dr. Burley also said, uh, uh, that evening we were unaware that several parents had been spoken to and that they um, had concerns regarding conversations that were, were taking place at the IEP table or maybe hadn't yet been taken, hadn't yet taken place at the IEP table, but parents were communicating um, with, with friends and other parents that have uh, children um, with special education service needs. So at that board meeting, the board did direct me to, uh, to follow up, and that's what I did. I spent the last three and a half weeks doing that, and I'm providing the board an update um, tonight. So since then, I've done a number of things. I've spent a lot of time digging into special ed, and I've spoken to several families with a few um, that I will be speaking to uh, yet this week. I've visited the classroom, spoken to some of our special education teachers, uh, principals and assistant principals, certainly Mrs. Frake and Mrs. Boyd before her departure. <coughs> Um, spoke to special education teachers and one former facilitator to really get my head around where the district has been um, over the last decade or more and kind of what direction uh, we are heading in moving forward. Um, one thing I think is very important for everyone to understand is this district, like every other, provides a continuum of service and that continuum of service varies based on each child's needs, which is why that conversation is taking place at the IEP table are so essential, where there are teachers, both regular ed, special ed, the parents are there and administrators are there. The nature of special education and the continuum of service um, discussion is to take place at that table. So everyone that has a vested interest and stake in that child has a voice at the table. We often talk about least restrictive environment and based on needs that the children have, um, that's gonna look different. And that's why that continuum is so important. But we're always looking to educate children in a least restrictive environment. Nothing that's too restrictive or nothing that's too vast that's not going to meet their needs. That IEP team helps identify those exact needs that are going to uh, increase the likelihood of goals being reached. Historically, we used to be part of a uh, cooperative, METSIP. And a number of years ago, METSEP disbanded. And when it disbanded, the district over the course of just under 10 years has changed its service delivery model and its placement of students throughout the district. So the co-op disbanded, um, and we had satellite classrooms for a number of years where students with IEPs were sent to uh, various schools hosted if you will, um, our IEP students. So what that means, uh, satellite is not the model that we have right now. Now we have a model where every school has an instructional classroom and delivers resource support and all other supports within that continuum from speech and language to OTPT uh, to resource and then to instructional. Uh, that change was made under the direction of Jim Evans who was here. Um, he was the director just before Ms. Boyd um, joined us. He decided to pull those instructional classrooms back into each of the schools and we have run with that model um, ever since. Within our new strategic plan we have um, a, a major emphasis on student achievement and on providing differentiated support for students. Um, one way we're addressing the needs of special, special education students um, now that they're plugged into their home schools and they're being included more frequently is through the co-teaching model. That is in its second year here in the district and each year more and more classrooms and more and more schools are using co-teaching as a way to meet the needs of our special education population. Co-teaching has to do, and I think uh, this board may have been part of a presentation um, last year to hear about co-teaching, but the notion of it for those in the audience that are unaware is you have a general education teacher and a special education teacher in the same classroom and they're doing just that, they're co-teaching. They're delivering instruction at the same time uh, whole group instruction is taking place, some pre-teaching or reteaching is taking place, or perhaps different manipulatives or strategies are being used to help the identified students with an IEP uh, master the content. And sometimes they encompass other children that don't have an IEP, but might be struggling to grasp the content of a math concept or a reading strategy. So co-teaching really does benefit not only special education students but general education students and it is something that we're growing into as a district. We're doing more and more of it and we're getting better and better at it and I will say that largely um, the feedback that we've received from teachers and the few parents that I've talked to, it seems to be a model that um, everybody seems to be happy that we've brought into the district. So one of the you know, with every blessing is a curse, right? So one of the, the difficulties with not having satellite classrooms where they were run at just a couple schools and you had more children uh, per grade level, per grade level cluster, cluster receiving support services is something we experienced when we went to five elementary sites. So with children in their home school with IEPs 
at an instructional level, being educated at that home school. Our classroom, um, although our numbers could be small, we could. some of our schools have five instructional <coughs> students, some have six, some have seven, that's a small number, but they cover a large grade level span. And that has presented a problem for us over the last three years because the span is greater than the Illinois State Board of Education or the ISBE allows. The ISBE allows a, a four year span based on date of birth. I know that's what you're waiting to tell me. Um, based on date of birth. And in several of our schools um, across the district, we have a span larger than four years. So what that means is we have to, one of the things it means is we have to, we have to apply for a waiver in order to instruct children in the same classroom. And we have done that three times over, four waivers have been applied for over the past two years. Now, the problem with the waiver, and it kind of gets us to what started happening a month or so ago, excuse me, is that it's supposed to be a temporary fix or a stopgap. It's not supposed to be something that's done annually and in perpetuity. So, Jane Boyd and, and Mrs. Frake and the team started talking about what could we do differently to not have to need to apply for this waiver every year to really rectify this age span violation. And one of the conversations that began to be had was if we transition students um, to the middle school a year early, and that began. Hopefully many of you read uh, what I released uh, back in 2015. We've, we've since had three families um, move to the middle school early. And I would say some of them have had a great experience. Some, have had, it's some, of their, some of them have said it's been like a mixed bag. The transition was difficult. But it's happened in three cases. And those cases were handled on an individualized basis. And those conversations flowed through the IEP process. And I think that's probably why we didn't have 40 or 50 people in the audience starting back in 2015, even though we've done this three times since then. I think the kind of the seat change most recently was um, from the parents that I've spoken to, they felt as if they didn't have a choice, that it was a done deal, that they were being told that this was going to happen versus being part of that rich conversation that's supposed to happen at an IEP table. So uh, that is definitely one thing that you know, uh, became clear as I was talking to various um, employees and, and community members. But the reason it was happening was as part of a plan to try to fix this waiver. I don't believe that it's the only thing that that should have been considered and I, I did say to Mrs. Boyd, if not this, then what? What were some other options that we should be discussing with parents? And I think options are the key word. And some of them would be, you know, based on student need would be to do more inclusion or more co-teaching that transition to middle school a year early. Potentially a split day where instructional um, Offerings would happen at the middle school in the morning and then the students would be transported to their home school in the afternoon where they went to fine arts and they maybe had lunch and recess with their classmates. Um, and that would be to some as a, as a nice um, compromise. And, and one of the students that we have doing this at the time is, is having a wildly successful experience with that split day. But many of the children, you know, a split day is too much. That transition would be overwhelming. They struggle with transitions or, you know, it takes them longer even just to get their outerwear on and off and the bus ride and, you know, so it's not good for every child. But again, part of a conversation that should be taking place at an IEP table. Another option would be to remain at their home school for fifth grade. Um, and that is where we've landed for 18, 19. So every of the four children we we're talking about, they will wind up in their home school for fifth grade, but the work is not done yet. That, that decision's been made, but now we have to have further, discount, further conversation as a team once our new director starts tomorrow. It's like, welcome. We have, we have big, busy, busy work for you to do um, over the next couple of months. We have to decide how we're going to handle that age waiver situation because we have it in a number of schools. And I don't necessarily think applying for a waiver should be something that we just continue to do. I think we need to dig deeper and figure out how to resolve the problem so it just doesn't keep happening on an annual basis. Because at some point I do fear um, that the ISB may say no. What if they said no to us? Because we've applied for this a number of times and we're, we're not necessarily sticking to the essence of why a waiver should be applied for. Which is a supposed to be used judiciously. And I think is, we're is, stretching is, that. 
is what's limiting us um, physical space or is it a staffing issue? It's a, it's a combination of both. So one of the things and in terms of next steps, certainly when the new interim starts, the team will get together. This will be one of the big things that we're going to be talking about for the remainder of this year. Um, <clears throat> When we start uh, talking with the board, and we're already prepping and planning for staffing, um, that conversation will start with the board in January um, or potentially February at the latest. One of the things we are going to have to consider to your question, uh, Eastman, is if we're going to add staff, so we'll talk about that, if that's necessary. If so, what's the percentage of staff that we might need and at what building, buildings? And if some of the buildings, I don't even know if two adults could really work in one classroom, plus the students, plus some of them have you know different equipment that they need. They have they have many assistants in the classrooms, so space is going to be an issue. Potential staffing allocation, you know, is something that we need to think about and really sit um, and look at birthdays and look at IEPs and look at that master schedule with the principals. Because what's happening now is we try to have at every building, regardless of this, the younger folks typically cluster their specials in maybe the morning and the older kids are having theirs in the afternoon and then you're flipping math and literacy instruction so you can split intervention teachers and resource teachers. It's a giant puzzle and we're gonna probably have to un un undo that puzzle a little bit and see what changes, if any, we can make to the master schedule to potentially help the problem or shift some resource staff into the instructional room. I mean, so we have a lot of work to do. I don't want anybody to think that, oh, it's just absolutely going to be we're going to add instructional staff. We really need to look at the schedule and we need to look at our staffing allocations to see what we can do um, beyond just a waiver. And if the board doesn't want to increase allocations, then of course we'll, we'll apply for the waiver again and we'll see. You know, if the ISB is going to say yes or not, but that's part of a conversation that we'll have with you. Um, and then again, we do need to look at, at um, the physical space. Some of the classrooms are larger than others. Some of them have four children in there. Some of them have six or eight children rotating in there, in and out of those classrooms throughout the course of the day. There are times in the day that they're all in there. From what the principals have said, it's not big chunks of time, but we do have to look at the schedule. So I wanted the families involved to know that they don't have to worry about next year, the kids are gonna stay where they need to stay, but our team now has a lot more work to do in terms of staffing and space and whatnot to see how we can't rectify um, the problem that I think just continuing to apply for a waiver presents. I don't think it's a solution uh, for the long run. And I think that is one of the reasons that this conversation started to be had um, with, with parents. So that is um, my report to date. Uh, still much work to do. And what I would plan to do, if it's okay with the board and if you're interested, is just bring you monthly updates. Just kind of have this as a reoccurring topic each month to let you know how much further we've moved the ball from meeting to meeting down the, the court and, and, and to, or the field, getting my, my sports mixed up, um, and, and let you know what we, what we land on. And we start looking at staffing in February, March, that time, right? I'm sorry. So we start looking at staffing needs for next year? Yeah, we're already doing January. that, mm -hmm. okay. starting in January. But we've actually Great. done some preliminary. It never ends. I mean, school starts and we're already watching numbers and whatnot. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, any questions by the board of Dr. Heinz? I want, to, I want to share that Dr. Hines has done an incredible job over the past few weeks investigating all of these details and working with families and communicating with everyone everywhere. Um, it's, it's great to have such interest. Uh, I, I do agree that we do have a lot of work to do. We had one deviation last year and three deviations this year, so as you see, they're increasing, and the spirit of the rules are for, it's a deviation in case you have a student that moves in in the middle of the year. You shouldn't really start the year planning to not follow the Illinois State yeah. Board of Ed regulations. That's and what's not sitting right with me. Yeah. So we do have a lot of work to do, but I appreciate everyone's interest and cooperation. I look forward to working with Dr. Hines and parents and the interim <laughs> and the interim absolutely and I'm sure we'll come up with uh, a good solution for the kids. Well before we go to the audience I, I, I'm glad to hear that parents are absolutely going to be involved. IE pre, IEP process is going to be honored and a multitude of options will be considered and, and no one is going to be forced into any decision. So that's, that's the, the goal of this entire process. So that being said, I now go to the audience and if there's anybody who'd like to make a comment on this issue, uh, after he hearing what you've just heard as far as the update goes, 
uh, you can approach the podium. Good evening. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, my name is Mickey Tessia. You may remember me from the last meeting. Um, so we're back. Uh, so first I want to thank you for putting special education on the school board agenda. Uh, it's an extremely important issue to me, to the other parents that have children with special needs and I think based on the, uh, judging by the crowd that's here on a snowy night, I think for the community as a whole. Um, and I'd like to thank the community here who don't have a direct interest um, in special education. I'd like to thank you all for coming as well. Um, because of the importance of this issue, there are going to be several parents that are going to um, have some comments um, for the board. The first thing that I want to say um, is, Dr. Hines, thank you for calling last week, me and some other parents, and telling us that the uh, decision or the policy to transfer our fifth graders um, to the instruction in the instructional program one year early has been rescinded. Um, I did I, I, during the call last week. I, I I did ask you about chil about children who are younger because there was concern expressed to me, rightly so, by parents who have younger children that the, the decision to rescind the policy might be limited really to next year, perhaps in light of the hype, and that you know it would be revived a year or two from now. And you had um, indicated that that is not the case. I think um, you'll hear- flow through the IEP process, be part of that conversation. Okay. Um, so so I'm glad that, that, that the unilateral policy that was implemented is off the table. Um, I did ask you also, and you had talked about the IEP process, which we all agree is very important, um, and, and whether or not I think some parents, including myself, was concerned that um, somehow there would be an unstated policy by the district, given the resource issues that you already identified, that somehow this plan would would be pushed through the IEP process and really pushed on the parents, um, and you had confirmed that that would not be the case. And can so, I, can I respond? To yeah. That, um, and I was going to mention this in my closing, but it just makes sense if you don't mind that I'm just going to say it now. Um, so, and you know this, but for those that have no children in special ed, you might not. The IEP process is where teachers and um, parents, advocates, attorneys, they have an equal voice at the table and they, they work to reach consensus around what's best for the child. That's the main goal. Sides don't always see eye to eye, but there's a, a process that, that you use when you, when you reach a stalemate at the IEP table. If you can't reach consensus, and you've tried everything, and you've come to the table in good faith, and you've worked very hard to, to reach consensus on placement, um, it's called due process. So if, if things are not, Agreeable, and you've not reached consensus, a family can, can file, can end the meeting, and, and move forward to go to due process. So in terms of a fear, so let's say you know, a family of a third grader who I've spoken to might be worried about that. And next year that happens where they, they're feeling pressured, and they're feeling as if their voice isn't being heard. They end the meeting, and they can file for mediation and due process. It's a 36-page document. It's well written and supported at the ISBE level and it's also in the law. So that's the process in which you would use to solve a dispute. So there should be no fear that if it's mentioned and you feel as though it's falling on deaf ears, the due process is, is the proper course of action. Now I'm not saying go run out and file a bunch of due process against the district. <laughs> that's a rare occasion, thankfully. We have just a handful of any of due process cases a year and those cases are pretty extreme. But that is the, the correct avenue in which to go when you feel as if your voice is not being heard or you have been unable to reach consensus at the IEP table. And, and as you know, I, I, I know that, and there are yes. parents out here who know that as well. I think the problem with that, if I can just respond for a second, is that um, you'll hear from parents tonight who contemplated due process this past year and just decided that it was cost prohibitive. I mean, to hire a lawyer and spend thousands of dollars to, to, to do what you feel is right for your child, I don't think should be um, kind of a solution that we're proffering to the public. And I, and, and I think in terms of this IEP process and this particular decision about placement, you know, what we're worried about is you get to the IEP process, 
and there's a decision by the IEP team that the child should be you know moved early to middle school because the elementary schools are not going to provide the resources and and um, that's I think one of the concerns that we have and that if if, if, if we're going to have fifth graders in the instructional programs that they should have resources that are sufficient to support their IEP goals in the elementary schools and not just in the middle schools. Um, I also want to thank bo the board um, for, uh, I know a lot of you have talked to us in the last month, supported us in our efforts to have this policy rescinded. Um, Dr. Borelli, I, I heard your comments about you know, the role of the board. Um, I, the only thing I'd want to say is I don't think any of us came to the board because we wanted to complain about a particular IEP decision that was being made. The problem was we were told this was going to take place outside of the IEP process. That's and so it was a policy decision that we were complaining about, not an individual student issue. Um, and I think you're our elected officials, we're taxpayers. If we have a problem with a policy of the district or an operational issue that is maybe gray area between policy and operation, that we should feel entitled to come to the board to talk about that. Um, because otherwise, I don't know what I'm voting for. I encourage that all the time. Yeah. And um, but now that the um, issue of the immediate issue is behind us anyway, um, the larger issue of special education needs to be addressed. And I think we can agree that the past month has been tumultuous when it comes to special ed in the district. Um, and you know, it has been become apparent to me and to a lot of people here, now that we're all kind of talking to each other, that there has been what appears to be a systematic practice of disrespectful and condescending treatment of parents at best with negative effects on the children and families. And these issues go far beyond this particular fifth grade placement issue. And you'll hear tonight from some families who will tell their own stories. They're not my stories to tell. Now, in some ways, I think it's regretful that the special education problems had to come to light in such a public way. Um, but on the other hand, we think that, when I say we, I mean parents and me, uh, that it was probably an important crisis to go through because these issues really needed to be uncovered and purged in order to start anew. So we hope that the lesson that's been learned um, in the last month is that parents are an integral part of the educational planning for their children. And as Larry, as you quite correctly said at the last board meeting, we are the, the experts on our children. We're the only experts on our children, and so therefore our views and opinions must be an important consideration. We're now ready to look uh, to the future and are very excited and hopeful about the next chapter in special education because we believe actually that there's a big opportunity right now to significantly improve the program. And we parents want to be an integral part of setting the district's... Sorry. We want to be an integral part of setting the district's values when it comes to special education and then determining how to best effectuate those values. And so we understand, Dr. Hines, that um, you're intending to conduct an audit of the special education program, and we think that could actually be a very good thing because obviously there have been problems. We request that the board appoint a subcommittee or a task force comprised of board members, representatives of the district, and representative, representatives of parents with children um, with special needs. With this committee or task force charged with overseeing the audit process, reviewing the results of the audit, and making programmatic decisions regarding the structure of special education. We have some concerns about the audit, um, maybe because we don't know very much about it yet, but we're a little wary of the purpose of the audit. Is the purpose to determine the cheapest way to meet the district's obligations to our children under Illinois and federal law, or is the purpose to determine what's the best approach to educate our children and then implement a plan accordingly? For example, we have heard that perhaps reinstituting a satellite program is again on the table. We have a lot of concerns with that plan because we fundamentally believe that our children belong in their home schools, just like every other child in the district. And I again refer back to the bubble analogy that I've made with several people, but 
you know, in a situation in t the typical, with the typical population, if there's a class that's on the bubble, the district, and I understand there was a situation like that in Roosevelt, the district doesn't consider removing two or three children from the under overpopulated school and moving them to the overpopulated school so that you're moving the kids to the, to the excess resources. The district then makes the decision to hire another teacher so that the children can be schooled in their home schools. And, and we, you know, I understand that the district does that because it understands the importance of these children and the continuity of relationships that we have, that they have, and, and, and the importance of being in their home school. And we see no reason why our children should be treated differently. We believe that the following are some of the important considerations of an audit or the future of special education in this district. We believe any decision on the future of special ed programming must be based on established scientific research regarding special education models that benefit our children. We believe that the prior fifth grade placement policy was not based on any research. In fact, we asked repeatedly for research uh, and were never provided with any, but that they were based primarily on administrative and, and financial concerns. We believe that inclusion in the home schools is important. Therefore, we suggest that the district hire an inclusion expert to opine on inclusion in our home schools and including the costs associated with that. Because I know at least two experts who are well known in the Chicago area who work with school districts on this issue. And they both say that if done properly, the incremental cost is not that much greater, if at all. The, Another issue that has arisen that has nothing to do with the fifth grade issue, but it, it, it's become apparent that the district is not equipped to handle students on the spectrum, with many of them being outplaced. So any audit that, that occurs needs to consider the best path to bring these children back to, the home, to their home school in the district. And then to the extent that the district is concerned about or feels constrained by financial considerations, which we of course understand, we believe that a review of the spending on all children would be more appropriate than a microscopic review of the spending on every marginal dollar that is associated with our children. For example, it certainly costs the district more money to teach gifted children who are academically above grade level. It adds resource issues to the school, to the district. And it may be more cost effective to move that child up to wherever they are academically. But, but you don't do that. You don't push that agenda in an attempt to reduce costs. And we think that we deserve the same respect. In addition to the audit, the next special ed director is obviously a crucial hire. Among the attributes that we believe are important in the next director are one, a collaborative and respectful approach with parents. Two, a person who considers the interests of our children as a primary factor. And three, a person who philosophically believes in inclusion and has experience with successful inclusion models. We ask summarize, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. We ask that parents be involved in interviewing and deciding this next special education director. We also ask that there be an ongoing dialogue with the new SPED director and parents by way of a, of a special education PTO that is district-wide. There is much work to be done to improve the special education in this district, and we are very motivated to help the district get it right. We want to have direct input that is substantive and not merely ceremonial. We truly believe that a new beginning is here and look forward to working proactively and constructively with the district and the board in paving a path for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tom Brown, and I have a daughter uh, in third grade at Roosevelt who would have been impacted by this kind of um, uh, fifth grade issue had it, uh, you know, stayed in its, you know, the, in the uh, spirit that it was originally kind of communicated to us that it was uh, a across the board thing that was going to happen. And so we're very pleased that uh, the district is taking a step back from that. Um, <clears throat> I helped author a petition. Uh, and we asked people to sign a statement against this uh, policy, and we received over a thousand signatures. Uh, we certainly 
certainly weren't expecting that. Um, we had over 150, almost 150 comments speaking out against that policy. And we learned something, we, I, I learned something new, and that's that people in this community, um, they, um, you know, they're happy about having special ed students in the classrooms. They believe that special ed kids bring uh, an impact um, uh, the general education students in a very positive way. I think that it's, um, you know, very, um, I think it's well, well established through research that having general education uh, interactions for special ed kids is like, vitally important to their development. And this community believes that special ed students bring some very important things to the table for the general education population. It, it, it teaches, teaches them about diversity, about um, uh, fighting against challenges, about inclusion, uh, about what it means to be a community supporting one another and, um, and just being a compassionate for others. So, you know, all very important um, and valuable uh, experiences and, and lessons. And um, I just ask the board as we move forward with this uh, revamp or audit of the special education program in District 64 that you remember that this community wants special needs kids to stay in their home schools so that everyone can um, you know, enjoy the benefits of, of the mutual relationship there. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I printed out the petition because now that you know we're taking a step back, it's time for the petition to come down. And but these are 1,015 signatures, and it's up to 1,033 the last time I looked. Um, and there's 150 comments here. Uh, you know, I'd like to just turn this over and make it a matter of public record. <clears throat> Members of the board and Dr. Hines, I'd like to thank you for your attention to this important matter. Your I'd also like to thank my new colleagues for their comments. My name is Mike Lacasio. I've been a Park Ridge resident for 20 years. I have four boys. I have a senior at Maine South, a sophomore at Maine South, an eighth grader at uh, Lincoln Middle School, and a fourth grader at Washington. I want to once again thank Dr. Hines for her comments and the plan that you outlined tonight. Regardless, I would like to make a few points. Number one, the district is not in a position to decide my son's readiness for middle school. That is a parent's decision and ours to make alone and one we will make in his best interest. IEPs are individualized for a reason. Each child is unique and requires a holistic approach to ensure they receive a free and appropriate public education. I will tell you that is not an easy process. We go through it for my son, who is a complex case quarterly, and it's a lot of work, and there are at least 20 people in the room when we have that conversation. So we don't take it lightly, and I would tell you that due process is not a solution that we would look forward to. To state that special ed students don't form relationships with their peers is false. <clears throat> These children deserve an opportunity to attend their home school, <clears throat> no different than their general education peers so they can form relationships and have the opportunity to interact socially and learn with their peers. <clears throat> as you can see in the picture that I'm going to pass around, they have a lot of fun as well. <clears throat> my son is at the bottom center of that picture. <clears throat> Both my sons and his friends benefit from this interaction. And as a point of fact, it was recently noted in his IEP that my son learns best when paired with small groups of his peers. And I'm proud to tell you that he's getting A's in his general education curriculum. <clears throat> Regarding the waiver, while I recognize the notion that it's a temporary fix, and I'm certain that one of those waivers was received for my son, the idea that grouping a 10-year-old with a 14-year-old is somehow more appropriate than pairing a 10-year-old with a 7-year-old is misplaced. 
I think we're all aware of the changes that happen in middle school and the complexities associated with parenting through it. Rushing a young student into it is not wise and therefore the answer to me is a simple one. Add another special education teacher. As parents of special needs children, we <clears throat> each in our own right have become strong advocates for our children. And it only makes sense to work through this process collaboratively, inclusively, <clears throat> and most importantly, transparently, as communication must flow between us as we work together. I will tell you we were informed of this new policy at my son's most recent IEP meeting, and I did find Ms. Boyd's comments elusive at best when I put her on the spot around whose decision this was. It was flat out inappropriate. Finally, I'd like to thank you all, mostly all of our friends for showing up tonight. It means a lot for your support. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Martin. Uh, in 2008, our son was uh, diagnosed with autism uh, by the district here, and he has been attending uh, uh, District 64 ever since, for the past nine years. I think we have a perspective uh, on this that uh, might be a little broader than other uh, parents with younger children. When our son was diagnosed with autism, we took him out to see Dr. Stanley Greenspan, who is the guru on autism. He's now deceased. He's written several books uh, on the subject. In fact, he coined the term the spectrum. In that meeting at his mansion in Bethesda, Maryland, he made two points to us. One, a mainstream education. Two, as much socialization as possible with same age peers. When Mark went to kindergarten, it was District 64's practice to place all the special needs children at Carpenter or Franklin. We researched that both on a psychological level and a legal level and strongly disagreed with that and felt very strongly that he should be placed in his home school, where he resides, where his sibling went to school. And we had a meeting with the uh, team at the time. I will say there were some against placing him in his home school. At that time, Kim Nashin was the principal of Washington. And she said, you know what? We're gonna give it a try. And we gave it a try. The first uh, year of kindergarten, Mark, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark split his time between Carpenter and Washington. It's not easy on the family. This idea of splitting time, it seems uh, impractical. What, what are parents supposed to, <clears throat> supposed to do for transportation. Maybe it's not such an issue between uh, Washington and Lincoln, but it certainly would be an issue uh, for Emerson. Uh, and you're still singling out the children. You're still um, uh, isolating them. And it just does not seem like a viable solution. But for us, we, we didn't have a complaint about it because we were getting the extra services, but that was kindergarten. That wasn't sixth grade. Mark thrived at Washington, years one through four. He went from not being able to hold a crayon to being able to draw a picture completely within the lines. But I don't know what happened. In the last three years, in our experience, the special needs program in District 64 has demonstrably uh, uh, de decreased. Fifth grade, his a aid's taken away. We have them with teachers who are not trained with special needs, who are telling the kids they're gonna strangle them, who are calling the police on my son. Uh, that's what we're getting. And what I want these parents to know, and my comments are more addressed to these parents, is that the special needs program in the middle school is no great shakes. To say it is, and it's a source of pride, is looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. 
My biggest concern about these children, these young children being placed in an environment with older children is their physical safety. You're talking about kids that are different. That makes people nervous. It makes their peers nervous. And how do they respond to that? Well, sometimes we're encountered with bullying. My child at Lincoln has been assaulted physically at least 10 times. At least 10 times. We've made complaints. It's been swept under the rug. I had a teacher at Lincoln saying he was going to fenestrate the class. I'm sitting with my son at lunch. He says, Dad, what does defenestrate mean? I said, I have no idea. And he looked it up on Google. It means assassinate someone by throwing them out the window. And this is the teacher at Lincoln. So you want to take these challenged kids who are in fifth grade and put them in this environment? It just does not make sense uh, to me. It seems to me this is a funding issue. It says that a waiver has to be applied for. Didn't seem to be a problem when Mark was kindergarten through uh, fourth grade. But so you can have to hire more people so they can have kids the same age with each other so there's not this age difference that you're going to have to talk about. We have money to hire a school resource officer. Things are so dangerous at the school, we have to have a police officer there. Uh, we can build these new vegetables. Well, how about putting some attention on the special needs children? And thank you. My name is Lorena Fisher and this is my husband Thomas. Two of our sons attend elementary school. Leo is seven and Alex is six. We are speaking this evening to make this forum aware that the fifth grade placement issue is just one example of the lack of communication, disrespect of the IEP process, and blatantly stated disrespect of the special education community. We want to thank the parents who spoke out publicly before the fight against the fifth grade placement was lost and many kids would be adversely affected. This issue has brought this community together and the support is truly humbling. It has allowed other parents to share the stories of the fights that they have lost that were not in the headlines and were not made public to the board. Our son Alex was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He's energetic, social, and will look you square in the eyes and say hello and give you a big hug. He, was, he successfully attended two years of pre-K at Jefferson. He was in a structured and general education class. When the time came to go to kindergarten, the IE team together decided Alex should be in general education with a full-time aid. The 2016-17 school year started and our, both our younger boys attended their home school of Washington. Alex was his usual self and gaining success. Fast forward to the spring of 2017. Alex was showing signs of frustration and aggression. In April, the district recommended Alex be outplaced. We wanted Alex to finish the school year and then consider options. We were adamant that consistency was so important and his behavior plan must be followed or negative routines would be formed with individuals that would be so difficult to change. His aid being changed a few times didn't help the situation. On April 20th at 12.28 p.m., I was contacted by the school. Alex would need to be picked up because he was suspended. He was playing with his aide in the playground and became aggressive with her, with her regarding a ball. I was informed the principal was not on site. Jane Boyne was contacted and decided he would be suspended for the rest of the day, the rest of the day and the following one. The school shared that he had no remorse and didn't really understood what happened. As I heard this, I was in disbelief and my thoughts were, obviously he has autism. The incident on the playground took place at 12.20 p.m. Only eight minutes before I received the notification call. It was obvious the IEP behavioral plan 
and process was completely disregarded, not followed, and a unilateral decision was made without any input from the IEP team. Later that evening, we received an IEP, uh, an updated behavioral plan, which stated, consider this email an amendment to his current IEP. Another disregard of the very important IEP process. The behavioral plan is part of the IEP, and it cannot be changed without an official IEP meeting or using an amendment form when both the district and the parents discuss and agree. We asked the district many questions that have never been directly answered, but the following one was. We asked, how can you suspend a kindergartner with an IEP who's exhibiting behavior that is a manifestation of his disability? The suspension only rewarded Alex for his behavior and taught him if he shows aggression, he can go home and spend time with mom and dad. The district's answer, we don't believe this behavior was related to autism. From April 25th to May 5th, Alex spent his school days in isolation in the vice principal's office, eating his lunch and working, as my husband and I frantically searched for other options. Feedback was received from many advocates. This is right. This is not legal. You need to fight this. Tom and I had to decide, what were we fighting for? It was clear the district wanted Alex out and wasn't willing to make any changes to support his specific needs. Our main goal was to get Alex out of this isolated teaching situation and into a le least restrictive environment that was healthy and he could regain his happy and social spirit. Also, since the district did not offer, we requested a psychological and psychiatric review be completed because their belief was something else was causing this. Alex's domain document was updated per the IEP and the dates required for the, av the evaluation were not met. The district offered no explanation, just confusion. The evaluation was finally completed this past October. And the findings were of no surprise to Tom and me. Alex has autism and a possibility of ADHD, which is very common with kids on the spectrum. So the actions Alex was suspended for was directly related to his disability. On May 8th, three weeks before the end of the 2016-2017 school year, Alex was outplaced at a special education program in Morton Grove. In August, the beginning of first grade, Alex was transitioned again to a general education school in Skokie because he was meeting his goals and he needed to be in an environment with peer interactions and general education inclusion. At his last IEP meeting, Alex was doing great and is extremely happy. It's unfortunate that success could not occur at his home school where his brother attends and where he would form friendships with his neighborhood children. Alex would love waiting for the yellow bus to come pick him up in the morning for the five minute drive with his friends. He now gets into a car by himself and drives 30 minutes to get to his new school. Once I learned that James Boyd's last day was December 1st, I emailed again, as I have done multiple times in the past, requesting she directly answer questions regarding Alex that were never addressed before her, before her departure. Her response? At this point, we have two different perspectives on what occurred. My suggestion is that you move forward and focus on Alex's needs and support in the future. I know how much this experience has negatively impacted my family, especially Alex. We are still working through the issues, but I have found in the past month that this is problem is just not limited to Alex, and I'm not here to specifically talk about him, but about the problems in the district regarding special education and autism specifically. How many kids with IEPs have been suspended? How many are outplaced because they could not reach success at their home school? What is the long-term cost of the outplacing these, ki outplacing these kids versus establishing inclusion training by experts to gain knowledge locally in our District 64 schools? Lastly, I often wonder what the impact was to the 20 classmates that attended kindergarten with Alex and what their understanding is of a child like Alex that is different. He was just sent away. I believe the experience could have been different and positive. 
We hope someday Alex can return to District 64 to enjoy the same opportunities as other kiddos his age. And as a family, we look, just, we look forward to just having the same calendar schedule. We do know that this, we, know, we do know this, Alex will not return until changes take place and there's a better understanding of how to treat and teach each individual child with autism or any special need. I respectfully request any audit or actions moving forward consider these issues. Thank you. That's Alex. Hello, my name is John Petracci. I only really know one of the board members vaguely just from my uh, kids' interaction with his kids and during events here at the school. My child was born in 2009, six weeks early. Uh, from all appearances, he's a normal child. He doesn't have really any kind of outward differentials between any other child that has gone to Franklin or uh, Jefferson. Um, he spent uh, AM and PM uh, preschool here, and then the one year uh, this school had kindergarten with Miss Borowski, Mrs. B. Whatever happened to that? Whether she wanted to take a leave with her husband and to come back, you guys lost a champ with that one. If you guys can ever get her back to teach here or teach at any other school in this district, you should do that. You should really bring a person like that back in here into this school or any other school. My kid spent uh, a year of kindergarten here, uh, Wukash did, for, uh, with children of various different levels of need. And uh, the kids who you, that was said, not you, may have not said it, but that children's of, children of different needs don't form relationships. I was fortunate enough to have a period of time in my career that I can come here and be with my son during lunch. And one of the families here, uh, her daughter, would I would allow to go to, back to classroom, and I would wait, and her daughter would hold my hand, walking every time I would be here, to here, I was here for my son, but she would take my hand and come here. My son, he has a, such a big heart towards every child that he interacts with, whether they're a child of special needs, of no needs, of advanced needs, and the people that have taught him and groomed him from where he was, which was baby babble at uh, pre preschool one a.m. to where he's now, those are the people you keep. And I'm not sure about this um, IEP exemption that you have to get. Does that cost money? No. Okay, so I'm confused that why don't you guys go to the state or whoever makes these rules for the IEP that's up to four years, what was it? And that you have to get this uh, exemption every year? Whoever decides that, if you guys have more people with an age gap, instead of complaining and moaning and groaning, we got to go get this free exemption every year, why don't you go get the rule changed? To where it just not affects this school, it affects everybody. Sorry, I'm yelling at you. Okay? Now, I don't, Park Ridge has a big, vast income level from very high to basically poverty. Okay? Um, not poverty, but lesser income. All right? So, I pay taxes. Y'all pay tax unless you don't live in Park Ridge, okay? Um, I'm just con concerned that, oh, my child has, Wukash has very little need to be taken out of his class that one day somebody who gives a rat's ass about him can suddenly say that my fourth or fifth grade is going to go into junior high school, middle school, whatever it's called now. And these prepubescent, stronger children are going to notice this kind child walking down the hallway. They're going to bump them. And that's not right. Taking a child who's that tall and putting with children this tall is wrong. 
I don't know if any of you have children who have had special needs. I have had special needs when I was in the 70s. Nothing like an IEP program helped me. I was lucky enough that my mom was educated, advanced educated, and she stuck to me. Football and the Navy brought me looking you guys in, in the eyes, every one of you. And you guys had to fix whatever's broken. Where you have to throw money at it, or you have to bring in something new, take something out. But if you guys even think about taking a child out of his general education class and take him to another school, one example, I, I don't know if the parents are going to walk up or not now, I'll be over soon. Um, a child was going to uh, Franklin, and uh, I'm a cub master in his den. And he was, he gets pulled out for, I don't know personally what, because it's none of my business. He gets pulled out for a few things. And the teacher that he was seeing at Franklin, I guess, was uh, she moved on, or he moved on. And that person was not replaced. Then they were told, well, you got to take your child now to, I think, Washington? Roosevelt, sorry. That child regressed a year from when I first met that child all through the last year. This child was when I first met him. Changing a child's structure. Y'all get up in the morning, shave, shave or whatever you got to take care of in the morning. You go to your other jobs unless you're employed by the school. You go home, stay with your family, go to bed, rinse and repeat, get up in the morning. There's some deviations to your schedule. Deviate a four-year-old, five-year-old, eight-year-old from their schedule. You don't want to be there from your child who does need to have some hands-on to a child that needs to have a lot of hands-on. All of a sudden, they're just like whacked. Why are you breaking me? I had everything fixed going right in this direction. And now I'm broken again. That puts the stress on the parents like you have no idea. You gotta fix it before you break it more. And everything that these other parents have spoken about, that they have these nice elaborate things to say because they've sat down, they studied it, they know their IEPs inside and out. When I sit down for my IEP, I actually encourage them to put more words on my son's spelling test or vocabulary. Because I think he can handle it. Everybody else has a lot more problems than my son does. If you don't listen to these people, you're not listening to anything that they're saying. Anything at all. So you have to look at those children in the eyes and find out why can't we just fix it. This is one of the better school districts in the state. Why are we doing this to break their routine? Thank you and have a good evening. My name is Katie Sapaniak. I am the mother of three and a Park Ridge resident. Um, I hold a master's degree in elementary education and I'm in my 10th year of teaching in District 65, Evanston. When looking for homes before my oldest was born, the major determining factor in where I would buy a home was the school district and I chose District 64. My son Connor was born prematurely, and had he been born on time, he, he would have been in the following school year. And so we asked that he be held back in three-year-old preschool, four-year-old preschool, and by kindergarten, he was by far the smallest child, the youngest child, and members of his IE team, IEP team agreed that we look to possibly holding him back. We hired a BCBA, which is a specialist in autism, um, to do an evaluation and to see her opinion and what she thought. Um, it comprised of uh, her assessing him in a variety of environments. She, was, she came to his kindergarten classroom at Field, um, and she strongly recommended that he be retained so that he could catch up physically, socially, and academically. 
and um, with his IEP goals, he was not meeting 50% of his goals at the time. Our developmental pediatrician wrote a letter to the school district as well. Ms. Boyd um, denied our request, stating that her BCBA had assessed Connor for two hours in the school setting. Though this conflicted with our BCBA's eight-hour observation, we were told that it would be devastating to see his peers moving forward. At this time, we hadn't gone gluten-free and dairy-free, which helps autism. His autism was so severe that he could not even remember the name of one of his classmates. We responded that we had just purchased a new home in the Washington boundary, and this wouldn't be an issue. Uh, Ms. Boyd replied that she had refused to retain my son and considered the matter closed and she would not discuss it further. We had to make the hard decision to pull our child out this year. Um, I educate him at home while after working a full-time job teaching other children and I'm using a kindergarten curriculum. He's developmentally right where he should be. He takes 16 hours a week of um, ABA therapy to help his autism and he's doing really well. He is not devastated at all that his peers have moved on. And I echo the voices of other concerned special needs parents who feel that their children have not been given the amazing education that brought us to District 64. And I look to the board to please find a candidate who's going to make the decisions with compassion and have each child's interest at heart. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Barbara Spiewak. Um, I am a field parent of Peter, who is in fourth grade, and Isaac, who is in second grade. And they both have special needs. They have Down syndrome. Um, I just want to thank the board for the support that you showed us on our segregation issue. You brought up great points and questions to Jane Boyd that evening when we were told on several occasions by Jane Boyd that this was an operations issue. You had no authority over this decision. So I want to thank the board members who participated in a very constructive discussions with us parents and took a very hard look at the placement segregation being mandated to our fourth grade instructional students. A policy of placing our kids in the most restricted environment. You, you answered our plea. Thank you to Dr. Hines, who personally met with Mickey and I after the last board meeting, assuring us that special ed services and the budget would not be cut. And thank you again, Dr. Hines, who personally called me last week to inform me that she and the district were walking back this policy and putting it back into the IEPs as an option, but assured us parents that we will feel no pressure from the team to do so at all. Thank you to the district for adhering to the placement policy of that our students are to be in the most least restrictive environment in their home school. There's so many kiddos coming up through Jefferson, kindergarten. My Isaac is second grade. This issue is, is it needs to be not a band-aid, not deviation applied. It needs to be fixed. Thank you for assuring us that you know that we will keep this appropriate model of special education for each child with special needs in their home school and exploring the different staff and therapeutic increases that need to be take place. Not only the staff resource, but OT, PT, speech. And thank you, Dr. Hines, that you'll be discussing this and presenting this to the board January, February of 2018. Thank you again, Dr. Hines, for being more transparent now and involving us parents to be a part of the interview committee for the next permanent special ed director.
And thank you for allowing us to help craft that new policy and path for our district that is desperately needed in special education. Thank you, Dr. Hines, for looking at developing a more formal special ed parent network in our district, like a PTO. Other districts have these, like District 200, so that we can keep up healthy conversations about our special ed programs, models, and services. I just want to end with a quote that we sent to you, Dr. Hines, too, on our follow-up um, letter to you. A quote from Pope St. John Paul II from 2000. A society will be judged on the basis of how it treats its weakest members. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you to all the speakers tonight. There's one more. We have one more. My name is Lena DeVito. My name is Lori Doman. And we just want to share a personal experience that happened to our children here in District 64. Um, so both of our um, children attended Franklin School. That's our home school. Um, this was last year. They were both first graders, and in November of um, 2016, we were notified um, that their instructional special ed teacher was going to be pulled out of Franklin in November. Um, there were no plans to rehire anyone um, as the instructional um, special ed teacher and that there would be someone else hired the following year which would be in second grade. And um, our only option for our children to receive instructional services would be for them to transfer out of Franklin in November um, and into Roosevelt. Um, and obviously, there's many concerns. Doing that to special needs children it, it's just not appropriate. Um, a new teacher should have been rehired on this spot. Um, I think the big, the big question, and, and to not go into details, everybody talks about the IEP process. I just have a question overall. You guys knew how many students you have at Jefferson, correct? It's a published number. You guys are administrations. The board has numbers. You know how many students are going to be going to first grade, second grade. You know where their home schools are, right? So we're talking about applying for this waiver. So you should already know forecasting, have an idea. There's general rules. You know, I don't want to say education is a business, but my job is to run a business. I have to look at schedules. I have to look at grids. And I have to make educated guesses based on trends or numbers. It felt like it didn't happen here. Like you did this with the movement and stuff with, and, and you know, every kid with special education, these movements, changing routine, changing structure is difficult. Aiden is a difficult child already, but everything needs to stay in place. We need to be on the same page from the IEP to the behavioral plan or anything. And the communication has to come both ways. And the board talks about, like, your guys is just the administration role, but does anybody ask the question, what's going to happen? Because here's the reality that it is our jobs as educators, parents, community members to educate these children. Because if we don't, in 10 years, what are we going to say to these, these children? We failed you. Good luck. Find a job somewhere. You're not going to have an educated, functioning society. These kids need structure. It would be like if I woke up today to say to you, you are used to doing this job every day and you're used to going here, but in two weeks, you are no longer going to be the superintendent. I need you to go teach a second grade class. Good luck and figure it out. You have two weeks. So that's where our anger comes into this. And it would be the same member for all of you board members. You guys have different roles and different jobs. I wouldn't want you to go tomorrow and be an educator. 
or go into a teacher's classroom. And it is about resources, and I understand that. But let's talk about it. Then maybe we need to look at where the dollars are going. And we talk about there's different ways to cut cost, if that's what the number one concern is. But I've heard it from every one of you several times. It's not about cost. We pay the tax dollars that we do to have these services in District 64. You want to be one of the top ranked districts so people move in and are willing to pay the tax dollars and willing to buy the houses prices at what they are. But if we're not going to get, it's a come and go in the equal schemes. We just want to be heard. I guess the, the option was like, we have no education source for Aiden, where we have to go to Roosevelt. And it is a smaller classroom, and it is better, but we've had two changes in aides and two changes in teachers. And they're only in second grade. My son's had four instructional teachers, and he's in second grade. And it's a different teacher every single year. So that's another huge concern, is what's happening with the staff. Why are they resigning in the middle of the year? Why are they constantly being pulled into the middle school? Why, why don't we have consistent people every year teaching K to one, or K to five, or K to two? Or there's an instructional teacher teaching third through fifth grade, and it's the same person. Like, these kids don't have one consistent teacher, and they're being pulled out of their school. What's happening? That's just not right. And it's, my, and it's starting over for the teacher to get to know the child. My child is, was very set back. I mean, and this year he has another new instructional teacher, and it's like completely starting over. It's just not appropriate. It's, it's just, there needs to be consistency. And we want answers about the staff. What is happening with the staff? Why is there so much movement? That's our, that's our concern. And we need to put the kids first. And we need consistency of staff. That's just. That's, that's, it's consistency. These and kids are special education. You know they thrive on structure. So it would be the same thing as in a regular classroom. I have a daughter at Franklin. She's had the same teachers taught second grade for 20 years. Why can't we have the same for our special education teacher? Is it, and they're all young teachers, so it is not a resource and thing. I'm just young add, teachers are at the bottom. I'm a special ed teacher and have been in the same position for eight years. I just don't get it. Thank you. Hi, uh, Lisa Zago. Mark Martin is my son. He has autism and goes to school at Lincoln. Uh, Mark's father was up here a few minutes ago speaking about our experience, and I agree with him. At first, it was a good one, but it has changed drastically over the years. And obviously, it's a funding issue. Obviously, that's the problem. Nobody wants to spend the money on this. Well, there's a problem with that. And the problem is these kids aren't going away. These kids are here. They go to school here. We have something called the ADA. That's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And under that act, these kids are to be allowed the same opportunities as everyone else. They can go to school in their home district. They can form relationships with other kids. This is a funding issue. I'm not going to beat around the bush. You better spend the money on it. We're not going away. Any other comments? <laughs> Thank you all for making your comments, helping the board to understand this issue. And uh, your comments have been taken and taken to heart. I appreciate them all. OK. Anybody want to take five minutes? OK. Next item on our agenda is uh, located on page 168 
in the uh, board packet. It's an update for the community and based on comments from the public and request by Vice President Biagi, the board has asked that the uh, IGA, which has not yet been seen by the board, uh, be passed by the firm of uh, Eccles, Williams, and Provenzal, experts in the field of SRO implementation, to review the document and make recommendations if necessary. We all feel this measure will further enhance the document, make certain the rights of the students will be well, well respected. And for an update on the entire process, I turn to Dr. Heinz. Can I just make one quick comment before it is on? Sorry, I'm losing my voice right now. So I just, I, everyone knows that on the board that I gave a memo to the board regarding uh, my interest in seeing the IGA reviewed by a, 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 another firm. For full disclosure for the public, um, Pat Provenzale, who's a partner, a named partner in the firm, is a high school friend of mine. He also happens to be the lawyer, the lead lawyer on the Naperville case, the unfortunate incident with an SRO where um, the, the student committed suicide. That's why I believed, and I'd had some conversations with Pat, why I believed that the firm was uniquely in a position to be reviewing IGAs because they're they're looking at it under a microscope in the context of the Naperville situation. So I, I made it clear to the board from a disclosure standpoint, myself, my law firm is not receiving any compensation, any benefit whatsoever from suggesting that the Echo Williams firm uh, look at this document. It's purely out of my interest in seeing that we have the best IGA possible drafted by the district. And frankly, uh, Rick, on behalf of the board, is a wonderful thought process. <coughs> And I think it can only be beneficial. I'd like, I'd like to add real quick. Uh, Rick, I researched uh, the, the firm that you recommended, and they are, they are <clears throat> absolutely highly uh, capable of handling this matter, and actually probably more so than capable. So <clears throat> my, uh, my agreement to go along with your recommendation uh, had to do with that. And, and I fully appreciate your, your transparency on, on your relationship. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Dr. Hines. Okay. Um, really, both of you um, stated what my update was going to be to, <laughs> to the Board of Education, so you made it nice and easy for me. Um, at each meeting, or each time this uh, item is on the agenda, I just provide you with a what? Am I on? I apologize. Um, so, in case you didn't hear me, I said these two fine gentlemen um, basically shared what I was to share. Uh, was that we are using another firm, Echo Williams and Provenzale, to take a look at the draft IGA. This came in just a couple weeks ago, this idea and this memo to the board. So it has um, caused Park Ridge to hold on the document that they looked at and made edits to, as well as Niles. We're still waiting to hear from Niles. They're lagging a little bit in communicating with us, but hopefully they're going to get back in touch with us um, once we receive the uh, additional edits from Echo, Williams, and Provenzale. At that point, and we're hoping that that will now change the, the first look for this board to our January meeting. It'll move through Niles, it'll move through Park Ridge uh, Police Departments, and then it'll move through the City Council over two meetings. Thank you. Um, it will then come to this board in January. And what I need clarity on from this board is would you like to see this IGA over two meetings, very much the way we handle um, our press policies, where we look at the press policy, we talk about it, you give me any edits, directions, or feedback, and then we look at it again the following meeting where I have time with the team uh, and, and potentially carry people from Hodges and, and perhaps um, Mr. Provenzale to, to, to weed through the feedback and the feedback that you have provided to us to enhance that document. Look at it again in February and then potentially have it on that agenda for approval. So, so we're going to look I, at it over the course of a few meetings. I've got a logistical question for Tony, that Tony, <laughs> and, and, and that is, uh, my understanding is that the Echo Williams firm is going to be providing us a red line version of the IGA Correct. as well as basically a memo. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. That's and what they told us. The yeah. memo is attorney client privileged, uh, I'm assuming. Right. Well, and well, I think we need to work through that issue because what I would ultimately like to see is that Pat or someone from his firm and you are both here and we talk through what the changes were and how we arrived at this and why we might have some of the things we weren't expecting to see in there potentially in this new IGA and Pat can explain to the board why we're doing that and it, as well as you but I don't know how to do that without necessarily waiving privilege on the memo or if we even care if we waive, waive yeah, privilege I on mean, the memo. Well until I see 
the memo. Right. Um, and I see the revisions. It's hard for me to comment specifically, but you made the point. It, depending on what's in there, it, it may not be highly confidential and maybe the board would be willing to waive Perfect. privilege. Yeah. Um, but as for that discussion you're talking about, uh, I think that would have to be here right. um, in open session. There, there is no closed session yeah. exception for that. So we would have to process that issue about whether or not there is anything, um, you know, student information, student data, right. things like that, which we've shared, right. um, that could not, definitely could not be discussed in open session. Well, and then there's kind of another, there's even a, an earlier issue with this, and that's, I've spoken to the mayor about this, our mayor and Park Ridge mayor, about it, and I think it's going to be the city council, Park Ridge's city council's intention to potentially bring the Echo Williams firm before them as well, too, to talk about the issues. So I don't know. Yeah, because the that's other our, that is now our attorney client yeah. privilege document, and, right. and now it'd be going before a whole other elected right. body. Right, and so the, we have to work that out. And I guess the other moving part here is yes, although we may be getting recommendations. Um, well, there are two other parties Correct. that need to review this and, and have to agree to those recommendations. So um, to the extent that they're comfortable with them, or we may have some feedback from their attorneys and from the city and from the village saying we're, we're not agreeable to all of these revisions. Right. I suspect part of the rationale behind at least City of Park Ridge wanting to look at it is they also have another IGA for an SRO program with 207 right. that's, that is already in place and they may want review mm -hmm. that as well too yeah. under this whole umbrella. So Yeah, but again, and I know we've made this, I think, abundantly clear through the, the repeated meetings where we brought this up. Um, that is a good point, but let's also remember, at least in the things, unless things have changed here, um, the high school model of the SRO program, equally at Naperville 203 as here, is much different than the intent and the spirit and the model that we were talking about with part-time SROs coming into our middle schools. So I do appreciate their expertise and their giving their insight. But we do have to remember that, that we are different than the high school. We, ha we have a complete different intent for this program than the high schools do. I would like to see a copy of the IGA provided to this board and to the public for the public to have an opportunity to review that IGA and have a conversation about that. And then uh, the opportunity for the attorneys to either clarify provisions that need to be clarified or add anything and then have a second reading where we vote on it. So what? two meetings. So yeah, I was gonna right. I was gonna go around and ask consensus. Uh, Eastman is left. Mark, one or two meetings. I'm sorry. One, one or, or two, two meetings. meetings. One meeting uh, to review it, and the yeah. following meeting to. Uh, vote. I guess two meetings would be appropriate. All right, Rick. I think two as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think two gives everybody the opportunity of reading it, understanding it. And just to make clear, the request is to see the final document. Because again, we're going to get a red line document. That needs to go to the other side. There may be things edited on their side or revised. So I just want to, and I don't right. care either way, right. what document are we talking about? Are we talking about the actual final document? Um, or are we talking about the final. document with proposed revisions before the cities have approved or revise well, those. It's in well, those, yeah. both of those cities' purview to disclose those documents as part of their own process. Right, once once they've agreed so, to them. So so they're 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 my, my own, the only issue I'm making is timing. It may not be January then. Mm -hmm. um, right. By the time we get this, get it to their legal counsel, they review it, make recommendations back, potentially we have to go back to the other firm. Right. Um, yeah. We may be talking about February, March, not January, February. So I just want to note that to right. everybody. And we've moved yeah. the agenda, right. we've moved the topic, and we've moved the timeline so many times. We're okay. just kind of rolling with it as it moves now, especially with an additional firm mm -hmm. right. involved. And, and, and when, when it needs to be on the agenda, it will, okay. from whether it starts in January to February or whether it's February to March. Yeah. We just need consensus on two meetings to, to kind of look at it when it's in final form, get feedback. Well, let's put it this way. I mean, it's not going to come to us until it's already been approved by the other authorities, correct? So essentially, it'll be in its final form already approved. Right. And then we enact on it. And if there's changes yet, then everything starts all over again. So, so the process that we're talking about is once the IGA is approved on both parts, we have a tentative agreement. Yes. And potentially the city or villages have approved it. Then coming to this body for two consecutive meetings to mm -hmm. review and take comment and then potentially bring it back Correct. for an addition. Okay. Correct. Correct. And so that was, I said yes. Do. 
do we want to consider one of those meetings being the copy that goes to the other uh, that goes to the other bodies and then the, the reason I bring this up is because if, if we're sending it to the other bodies for approval and they do approve it and then it comes to us no, and then we look at it exactly and right. we don't like it that's now we have to go back to them with a document we already presented them that's what I just said. and said yeah. so no I'm saying we should before we give it to them we should not set up our two meetings after mm -hmm. one of our meetings should be prior to so and and we we look at it say okay you know what this looks good enough to send over or we don't really see much you know that we want to change or or have any comments on then we send it over and then have yeah i would not want to put the cities in the position to have to act on the agreement twice just like i'm sure they wouldn't want to right. do that to you right um so i think there would be value <coughs> I mean, if hopefully the parties can reach out a tentative agreement We've got the agreement in final form. They've just not been approved yet. Subject then to a meeting here where we take public comment, maybe some feedback, and then letting Niles and the City of Park Ridge know that although we have a tentative agreement, there could be potential revisions after that meeting. Um, and so I think it's probably a final, well, a tentative final agreement, a meeting, and then potential more revisions, and then a final where it would then go to both, all three bodies. Um, for final approval. That makes more sense. Yeah. That, that seems like it, it gives us the opportunity to look at it. It gives the, the community an opportunity to comment on it. Yeah. And then we're presenting something to the other bodies that we're comfortable with right. and not trying to yeah. retract and go back and forth. Okay. That's right. Yep. So yes, two, two, two prior in that. Special session, special session of the school board just to look the first time at the IGN. Where that's the only thing we do. If there's the thing if the there's three members who request that, we can have a like a public hearing. No, it would no. Be just no, no, no. He's, at, he's asking a special meeting. Session. We have nothing else on the agenda. We're all focused. We're not tired. We're just looking at this issue. Yes, I'd, I'd support that. So it, R Riles made the uh, the motion. I uh, Sanchez supported. And I will support it as well. So there's three of us. So we'll schedule a special meeting at some point in January. Once once we have. The red line copy back? Is that what we're waiting on? Tentative, the tentative, tentative agreement from both Niles and Park Ridge. Mm -hmm. We no, will get a copy. No. And then before, no, before, before. Before it goes to Niles. Before it goes before to Niles and Park Ridge. Special meeting yeah. before? Yeah. Okay. So we can see it, discuss it, and understand what's going to be going to Niles and Park Ridge. So and, and, and open it up for comments. Right. Yes. And my understanding is you're going to, Tony, you're going to get this this week. Because they, they had confirmed that they were going to get it to you by the 18th. Yeah, yeah. correct. So, so so we'll have that so shortly. Just to be clear then, when I get that document, You've got you want to see that document. You don't want us to get that document, send it over to the city. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. All right. It makes sense to have it as clean as we can. You're right. To make it as clean as we can before it goes out, rather than send it out, it's agreed upon, and then we chew it up again. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. So, so I can understand. We get it. You get a tentative agreement. You look at it, right? You're going to still right look now. At it. No, no, it won't be a tentative agreement. It will be a proposed a agreement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. A red line so, draft, which it sounds like you're going to have a special meeting to review. So take comment. So we're going to review the red line draft, not the tentative agreement. Correct. Right. Well, so that's what just shifts it here. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to get a red line. You're going to review it. Right. Because we still we still want your eyes on it. Because just because we brought another firm in, at least my opinion is, I still want you to have your eyes on it. Of course. Thank you. Um, and once you have that red line, we will have a special meeting, which will be open. We will review it. We will allow public comment. <laughs> then we will have a, another meeting. Hopefully, I'll walk away with that meeting with a clear directive from the board, what if any revisions mm -hmm. they want to incorporate mm -hmm. or delete, at which point then we'll tender the agreement to the two uh, other municipalities. Um, they may come back with revisions, so I may need to come back to you again and talk to you about that. Um, and then hopefully at some point, we, all three parties will be on the same page and we can set it for a final action at all the board meetings. So in between you, after our special meeting and our, our discussions and whatever comments we get, we're going to send over something to the city. Right. If in that period of time, while we're waiting for them to review it, one of us comes up with something else that we didn't think about at the meeting. 
how do we then, do we call you or how do we then get we would that? Call Lori. Okay. And then she would communicate the message to us. Okay. So it's not too convoluted. It's really not. I mean, we look at it, we make corrections, we send it out, it comes back. We look at it, by that point, it's been pretty much ironed out. Yeah, right. Yeah. We have two meetings, it just happens. The first one's going to be a special session open to the public to review. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Okay. Any other board comments? Great. Uh, and we expect that red line, uh, you said, uh -huh. next week? We'll see, end of the week. I believe we're supposed to have it by the end of the week. Yes. This week. Right. End of this and week, maybe early next week. Yeah. No, you committed to this week. week? Yeah. But I had to look no? Monday. Bye. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, next item on our agenda is present draft calendar for 1819 school year, tentative draft calendar 1920 school year, beginning on page 169. Yes, so within appendix six of your uh, board packet, you have, as Tony described, two draft calendars for your consideration. What I'll do is I'll walk you through um, the highlights from 2018-19, 2019-20, and how our calendar aligns to District 207. And then you have an opportunity to give me any feedback. It'll then come back to you at a later meeting for approval. Community, I will tell you, is always anxious to get that next year's calendar approved so they can start doing some family planning. So hopefully um, you will see a lot of positives within these draft calendars, so we won't have too many changes to meet. For those of you that are new, this goes through a committee process where we have teachers um, and administrators and people in our support staff roles that sit and work with us on this committee to create the very best uh, schedule that we can or that we think is a, is a good schedule that allows for chunks of uninterrupted time for our students to really dig in to the, um, the work that their teachers have for them, but also then provides us opportunities to have institute days and professional development um, opportunities to continue to work with our staff. So uh, District 64, in terms of the 2018-19 calendar, I consider this the Scott Zimmerman kind of recommendation. We would be having Institute Day on Thursday, August 16th, and Friday, August 17th. It gives folks in the community an additional week of vacation before they, or to continue their summer vacation before kids um, come back to school. And as has been done in the, the last two to three years, we have paced about a week uh, behind District 207. They get a jump start. So as you can see, um, our families will have an extra week and an extra weekend, and our kids will start one week behind um, high school for families that have kids in both systems. Our first through eighth graders will come to school and start Monday, August 20th, so they'll have a nice full week of school. And our kindergartners will have their split orientation days on that Monday and that Tuesday, and our kindergartners will start school on Wednesday. Um, first day, as you can see, with the District 207 kids will be one week before on August 13th. Um, the next three breaks, Thanksgiving, winter, and spring, are all the same. And four years ago when we surveyed our parents in terms of how tightly aligned we wanted it to be to the high school schedule, um, the feedback overwhelmingly that we received was very tight in terms of these vacations for obvious reasons, for travel, for time to spend with family. So they're completely aligned across the three I, I do have, uh, mm -hmm. I totally understand that because I voted for that when, when we discussed that. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it, I think, uh, I don't have my phone with me, but on the calendar, I believe uh, Christmas Day is on a Tuesday, right? December 24th is a Monday, mm -hmm. and I question with Christmas Day being on Tuesday, coming back to school on that Monday, is anything really going to oh, get we accomplished? Oh, we, we don't come back. But we end on that Friday. So officially, the recess begins on Monday, December 24th. Oh, so it We're begins? We're closed. The district's closed always on the 24th. And gotcha. The 24th. Okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. And then the last day of school would be June 5th. And again, over the last three years, we've, we've ended school very early in June. And again, uh, more than a month later than um, the high school. You see how early they end, they end May 24th. And mm -hmm. we really don't see the need to be out of school for our young students um, in May. 
So those are some of the highlights. I think also worth noting um, that a minimum of 176 days of student attendance is required for board policy 6 colon 20. Um, District 64 schedules 180 days of student attendance and that provides us for those four potential emergency clo closing days for inclement weather um, if needed and we can use those four days without extending that end of school year date. If we use more than four, then the school year would um, would go later and if you look at the draft 2018-19 calendar you can take a, a peek at that June cell where you see the XED that has to do with the, the um, need if we had extra days built in to, uh, you know, I, uh, to meet the required days of student uh, and, and attendance. Yeah. By, by board policy it's 176. What is state law required? 175. One, 175. Mm -hmm. Do you know, because we've, we've talked about expanding contact hours and contact hours in different districts and our district and we've, we've talked about that, uh, contact hours in different areas. Um, are there different districts that have more days or are they all pretty much hold to the 176 They're all very tight to the, what the ISBE recommends and if we were ever to add additional days that would be something that would have to be negotiated. Oh sure, absolutely. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to know if that number was Good question. consistent throughout. <laughs> Um, 2019-2020 uh, follows a very similar plan. School year starts typically around August 15th, those two institute days. Starting that school year that Monday, um, August 19th, again kindergartners having their transition orientation days Monday, Tuesday uh, for an official start on Wednesday. Our breaks again Thanksgiving, winter and spring are exactly aligned with the high school. We're out June 3rd. So this is kind of becoming the template for our calendars and it's just been, we're really trying to stay within this window in terms of a mid-August uh, start to an early June dismissal. So what questions do you have relative to the draft calendars? It's pretty clean, pretty clear. Okay. Um, we, and we took a, a poke at the 2020-2021 at the last calendar committee meeting, but we, we just need to do a little bit more work. But that's, we're already beginning um, to craft that calendar. And this will be coming back next uh, Correct. Next meeting for a vote. Mm -hmm. So this is this is an example of something where we have presentation vote right. the next time. So. Any questions or thoughts that you have, please just send them my way. And I can push them out to the calendar committee. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments on the draft calendar? Not seeing any. Before I go any further, I'm always interested in your travel time. So uh, we have uh, first reading of a policy, uh, personnel report, consent agenda, and minutes coming up. Uh, does anybody on the board uh, feel the necessity of maintaining our legal counsel? Ooh. I think for our for new the, interim. Would you like to yeah. just maintain mm -hmm. that? Yep. All right, it's been recommended that you hang with us for a little while longer. Okay. So in the policy booklet is, is one policy, and it, it'll be for um, for, re for you to review, and it has to do with a policy that we must look at every two years and take press recommendations uh, into consideration. So this policy, um, Act 980349, has to do with the development and the implementation of a bullying policy, and that went into effect in 0708. What policy did you say? It's this seven is 7 colon 180. 180 yeah. Student prevention of and response to bullying, intimidation, and harassment. What you'll find within your packet are very minimal changes. It's page um, 174. From the policy that we have in effect right now, and we last reviewed it back in 2015. The only changes that have been made to the policy that we have in place um, has to do with the complaint manager, now considered a non-discrimination coordinator, and we've put Joel Martin in that uh, position with uh, Ms. Boyd's retirement. She typically would be the complaint manager now, which we refer to as non-discrimination coordinator. Um, once the new interim, not the interim, but once the new director takes over during the 18-19 school year, we'll let Joel off the hook. We'll put the director of pupil services or student services back as the non-discrimination coordinator. And depending on whether we hire a, a male or a female, I would seek to hire another uh, seek to have another member of my senior leadership team uh, of the opposite gender be uh, a non-discrimination coordinator as well, just so you have either um, a male or a female 
option if you, if you file a complaint. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, Lori, Lori Lopez is the complaint manager, and we probably are going to want to add you know, a male. So I don't know if you want to be that gentleman, Joel, but we're going to um, make sure we have both a male and female as a complaint manager as well. The only other thing then is number 10 that was added. Uh, they got rid of the word internet and, and said to put it on the website. Um, and then they also added at the very end of number 10, it has to do with student or designee shall post this policy on the district's website, which we have. It's included in the handbook, which we do. The last sentence uh, within number 10 is changed and must be provided periodically throughout the school year to students and faculty. We tend to go over this at the beginning of the year, so we would potentially consider doing that again, and maybe at a midpoint. So that would be the only change to our current practice. And we would begin that, uh, we could begin that even this year. Can it be done during the uh, Wednesdays, the early Wednesdays? It could potentially be done at a faculty meeting. We could do it at the beginning of the year as part of Institute Day, those two days that we have, and then just figuring out a midpoint, we could add it to a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, Lori, since you typically have quick access to that Wednesday, maybe we can find a, a time to distribute that mid-year. And that's the only substantive change. So. And, and so the board knows this is the first reading of the policy of 7-180. But uh, tonight it's also included in the consent agenda. Uh, and because there is minimus changes mm -hmm. and it is uh, repeated every two years, uh, the, the, really the, the driving force behind this is it's, I don't want to rubber stamp it, but it's, it's pretty much the same thing over and over again. So yeah, unless, like unless somebody feels the great necessity that we hold off on this, I think that because of the consistency uh, of the wording and the minimalist changes, we, we probably can move forward on this. Uh, all in favor? So I, I just want to ask, so there's no either legal or policy requirement that we hold a first read like no. the city has and no. not a second It's just the best practice. Okay. Yep. Cool. And with the minimalist changes or changes to references, yep. a lot of boards just bypass the first reading. Okay. Yeah. So everybody okay with that? Yep. Yep. Okay. All righty, next item, approval of recommended personnel reports. Beginning on page 181 with an action item on page 181. We have the modified personnel report at our desks. And uh, from what was printed, there's one edition, you'll see, or two editions. Uh, you'll see uh, right at the top um, an individual to employ as the interim director of pupil services for District 64. So, Dr. Heinz? Absolutely. So, uh, tonight I'm making a hiring recommendation uh, to, to bring in the interim director to replace Ms. Boyd. Um, and I am recommending that we hire Mr. Mike Petovic for approval as the interim director of student services uh, for the remainder of the 2017-18 school year. Uh, Mr. Padovic will be hired as the interim director on a contract not to exceed 100 days per TRS requirements. So he has recently retired from the Oak Park School District and it, luck will have it that we have around 105 days left of school. So he will be able to work almost the full school year as the interim. So pending board approval this evening, um, he will start tomorrow, Tuesday, um, December 12th, for those 100 days, and it will take us very near at the end of the school year. His compensation will be at a per diem rate of $530.40. Uh, a brief bio about Mr. Padovic. He retired in June as the Senior Director of Student Services in Oak Park School District 96, where he was employed for eight years. Prior to working in District 96, he served as the Director of Student Services in High School District 218 for five years. From 2001 to 2004, Mr. Padovic worked as the Director of Summit Learning Center, a therapeutic day school for students with severe learning needs. And prior to that, he was the Assistant Principal at the AERO, a special education cooperative in Burbank, Illinois. He has been very active in the field of special education, both through the state of Illinois and in professional organizations, such as serving as a board member on the Illinois Alliance of Administrators for Special Education, as a representative for Region 1, Illinois Alliance of Administrators of Special Education. He also served as a member of the Illinois Attorney General's Selection Committee on Special Education, the Illinois State Advisory Council Transition Committee, a member of the Illinois State Board of Education Due Process Screening Committee, and a former State Board of, Edu of Education Level 1 Due Process Hearing Officer. 
Mr. Padovic's educational background began uh, at Illinois State University, where he was a director. Oops, sorry, got that backwards. Where he received his undergraduate degree. He received a master's degree in social work, and he has a number of advanced degree certifications and special education licensures. His social work background uh, shown through in terms of what the interview committee loved most about him. Um, and the interview committee uh, for this interim position consisted of building level leadership, central office leadership, a member of the PREA board, uh, which is our district nurse, because uh, one of the groups that the director of people services oversees are the district nurses. So this eight member committee really um, found him to be a, a wealth of special education knowledge, but also a, a warm and engaging collaborative uh, educator. They liked his experiences in a similar role, in a similar district of size and, and uh, population. He has an extensive background in managing a number of related service providers, which is critical because he will be doing that here as well. He had an extremely in-depth knowledge of not only special education, but of special education law. <coughs> Um, he served as a mentor, and we really felt as though he would provide a lot of needed professional development for our teachers. He possessed in-depth understanding of the importance of the social-emotional development of students, and he had o a very overall just warm and personable manner about him, which we found um, very inviting. Uh, a tr uh, should you approve his uh, interim position, a press release is ready to go, and it'll go out first thing tomorrow morning. We will also welcome him first thing tomorrow morning to the ESC. Um, I have meet and greets scheduled with special education teams at all eight of our schools, and those will take place between now and winter break. Um, in January, uh, we will schedule a parent meet and greet, so uh, parents of, of students that have uh, special education IEPs or 504s can come and meet Mr. Padovic. Um, we have been working as a team to review uh, the transition plan, put together a calendar um, so he knows which meetings he may need to attend or other um, requirements or, or responsibilities that we want him to undertake while he is here. Um, he will also be working closely with uh, me and Mrs. Frake in terms of scheduling a special education audit and getting, getting that whole ball rolling. So I do recommend Mr. Mike Padovic for approval as the District 64 Interim Student Service Directors and uh, pending board approval, we would be very excited to bring him on board. You know, um, as you were going through that, I, I felt that the, his qualifications almost perfectly matched what we've heard the needs are mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, more importantly, I was, sounds like a great person, but I was interested in the transition, how we are going to get him up to speed and, mm -hmm. and intimately involved in some of the concerns that have been voiced, and it sounds like you've got some. Well, we've already started with the calendar. He's had a number of conversations with Joel. Um, he'll meet, um, the, as I said, the special education teams. Sure. They'll all have opportunities to um, share some of their top priorities within each of the buildings. He'll work with uh, Mrs. Frake, who's the assistant director, the two coordinators. So we're just going to indoctrinate him. We're going to have a parent uh, meeting. And we've built a priority calendar in terms of what really needs to get done. Um, he's not going to be able to do every, every task that a a seated director would be able to do, it would be just too hard to expect somebody to get up to speed that quickly. But Joel and I have been working, um, and as well as Mrs. Frake, to figure out what needs to be done. And, and we're going to continue to have that conversation, flush that out over the next you know, couple of weeks um, while we let him get his sea legs about him. Good. So the first things he needs to do is bridge that gap between the school district and the parents. Sure. Agreed. That's where we're going to do a parent meet and greet. For starters, mm -hmm. is, is is the district that he came from? Is it more of an inclusive, an inclusion style district, or a satellite district, or do you know what his philosophy is? I think it has a. It, Regardless of that, and I don't know, I don't often insert myself on these kinds of issues, but mm -hmm. we've had our firm has had extensive experience with Mr. Padovic and, and put aside his credentials, which are unbelievable, his experience, which is unbelievable. Um, I think when Dr. Hines approached us about this being one of her candidates, um, one of the things, at least as a firm, that we are, have always been so pleased about is his style. It is a very inclusive, collaborative, um, his social work background really comes through and helps in that. Uh, you guys will see right off the bat. Um, once you meet him, um, it's a much different uh, demeanor and personality. Um, 
than what's much been, different but his service than his district runs a continuum of service mm -hmm. and okay. yeah. philosophically he's yes. believes in inclusion. You're saying he's very personable and, and maybe our other director wasn't so personable? No, I'm just talking to his skills and that. Um, so does he have experience in the special ed audit? I do not know if he does, but I've been working, um, speaking to districts locally and, and to uh, our cooperatives, uh, and they're giving me names of folks that can do um, audits. Our neighboring district, District 63, conducted an audit, special education audit. I spoke to their director. They used the CEC, who we used a number of years ago to do a district-wide system assessment. But the superintendents of two local cooperatives, um, one of whom I'm meeting this week and one of whom I'm meeting next week, also have folks that are good at uh, conducting audits and they have recommendations. So I'm getting a number of names and firms and we'll go from there. So uh, while we're conducting this audit, you'll be deeply involved? He and I both, yes. <coughs> as well as Mrs. Frick. Do you know, does he have any special needs children on his own? I do not know that. I don't know. But I know he's a new grandpa. I, I do, he did share that. Might be a question I'd ask. Any other questions for me? Any questions on any of the folks on the personnel report? Not hearing any further comments, we do have an action item located on page 181. So I'll take a motion for this. Can, can, can I wait one second? Of course. Can, can we very quickly meet this interim special ed? Before voting? Well, no. I, I, we can vote on it. But I don't want him to be some stranger in the dark out there. Sure. After what and we've heard tonight, I, I, I want this to happen very quickly. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to ask, Claire. It's a fair thing to ask. He would have been here tonight, and I should have. I'm, I'm glad you said what you said. It's just slipped my mind. He is finishing up some strategic planning work that he was helping to facilitate in neighboring District 69, or else he would have absolutely been here. Yeah, because I'm a bit disturbed that yeah. he's not here. Yeah, well, and, he, uh, he had a... A, a previous commitment to, to finish up work in a neighboring district, and this was the first board meeting we had uh, available. Can, so, we, can we logistically pull that off without violating IOMA? We can't do. We can't have all seven of us meet and greet him without it being a public meeting. But we can schedule something or a time to right, come in. Have come to a public meeting. Yeah. But we're not going to have one. Post the meet and greet. Right. As right. That's the alternative. I can do that. Post the meet and yeah. Greet. yeah. It doesn't have to be in this setting. You can post. Right. A special Right. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but I'd like to sit down with him one-on-one -on -one quickly. Now, Mike made a point, um, and I apologize. Um, as Lori said, he had a pre-set sure meeting already with District 69 where he's serving as a consultant that was mm -hmm. set a long time ago. <clears throat> so he was very apologetic. He understood the importance of being here. He knows. Um, as Lori said, we've been chatting. He knows the importance of really coming in and relationship building. Larry, I think it's a great point to bring up. I think uh, that Mike would have no problem be eager to do that. Um, and he talked about, you know, uh, the importance of wanting to let the board know how eager he is to get started and to be a part of the team. So I think to maintain to maintain consistency of what we as a board have discussed regarding personnel reports i would like to i would like to say i do not want to meet him prior to taking on the recommendation of our superintendent because this is what we've all agreed is is a recommendation and we will be accepting the personnel report based on the recommendation and not by any personal knowledge of our own because we did not have the opportunity or nor uh should as a board in interviewing all our uh, our hires. However, will, however, having said that, ha having said that, in light of the situation and what's what's transpired, I do agree with Mr. Riles that it would be nice for us to meet him just so we can get a, a personal feel of of the type of uh, style he has, and hoping that it, it falls within what we what we see that our our parents are interested in. All right. Uh, so today is the 11th or 10th, whatever it is, uh, 11th, and Christmas is Christmas Day is two weeks. So if we were going to have this meet and greet kind of thing where we can do it, I'm just thinking of the logistics of when we could. Right, and I've taken care of that. I'll, let me tell you what we're thinking. So December is going to be the school. 
we're going to put something, get, get him in the district, first of all, start tomorrow. <laughs> um, he's got a lot that he's got to get up to speed on pretty quickly, one of which is going to be the calendaring. So we were going to try to find a date that worked for, for those of us that are going to participate in the parent meet and greet. And we've got to give parents leads and we've got to be able to advertise it, mm -hmm. get it on people's calendars. So we're looking to January. If we would like to, prior than January, so if Larry, if you're really interested in meeting Mike, I can put you in communication with Mike and you could come to the district office and you can chat with Mike. But we, we can't rush the meet and greet and, and, and try to actually have other people be able to attend. So I, I, I would, that being said, I would suggest that at our January meeting, he come to our meeting and speak to us in front of the open public forum and so he can introduce himself present his philosophy, you know, some of the things that he's encountered and how he's helped kind of get over these things. In the meantime, if there are any individual board members who would like to speak to him, contact you and you yes. can arrange that one-on-one. -on -one. Is that's, that okay? Yeah, just I think that's per I think that's perfect. Yep. That's a perfect way of handling it. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions on the personnel report? It's an action item, and uh, on 181 is the action item. Mark, you look like you want to read it. Sure. All right. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve the personnel report, noting that the personnel report is based on the recommendation of the superintendent and not upon the board's direct knowledge regarding any of the specific individuals selected for employment. Second. Rick's got the second. We'll start with Fred. Yes. 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 Okay. Consent agenda is the next item. It's located on page 103 with an action item on page 103. Any comments on any of the items? Not hearing any uh, discussion. Uh, Luann, I noticed that the uh, school district to pay certain invoices. Now we usually do this toward the end of the year as well. And so is, is this a twice a year kind of thing just because of the holidays and all? It really depends on how the meetings fall. So this meeting is so early in the month and then the next meeting doesn't It's so late. Yeah, so um, it helps us to be able to pay vendors, you know, kind of within a t more, you know, a timely period also. Gotcha. All right, any other questions on content of the consent agenda? Not hearing any, uh, take a motion on page 103. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve the consent agenda of December 11th, 2017, which includes bills, payrolls, and benefits, approval of financial update, and the period ending November 30th, 2017, Resolution 1195 regarding the school district to pay certain invoices prior to the board approval at the January 22, 2018 regular Board of Education meeting, second reading and approval of policy 7 colon 180 and destruction of audio closed minutes of which there are none. Second. Second. Mark's got the second starting with Mark. Yes. 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 Okay. And now I turn to our legal counsel. We have minutes and other discussion of items. Uh, <laughs> okay. Beginning on page 20, uh, 280, we have the approval of the minutes. Anybody like to make any suggestions or changes? Not hearing any, I'll take a motion. I move that the Board of Education of Community Consolidated School District 64, Park Ridge, Niles, Illinois, approve the minutes from the regular board meeting on November 13th, 2017, and the closed minutes on October 10th, October 23rd, and November 13th, 2017. Second. Rick's got the second, starting with Fred. Yes. 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 Dr. Heinz, other discussions? 
got about a hundred items to go over. Oh, Hang with That's me. All? Okay. That's it. Okay, the upcoming meeting, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, January 22nd. It will be at Jefferson and as uh, usual, we have a little more finessing of the agenda to do, but uh, the, this was the team's initial uh, brainstorm. Mm -hmm. I know right off the bat, uh, discussion of student fees, A5 will be removed from um, the January meeting agenda. Uh, Luann did mention today that uh, Appendix 8 through 11, although it makes it look lengthy, should move fairly quickly through the approval process they, because they all have to do with construction. Um, we will be talking to you about child care with confidence and we will be bringing for you discussion regarding 2018-19 um, registration and uh, registry uh, residency verification process mm -hmm. um, changes. So one of the things I wanted to know prior to that meeting, would, would new board members like us to include in a Friday memo our current process so you have a little bit of time to read it and get your heads around it? Or I think that would be a great idea. Yes, okay, please. so getting it, getting it out mm -hmm. in advance of that meeting so we can just quickly move through it at the meeting and then really spend more of our time talking about the recommended changes and the rationale behind the changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is that. The next meeting that we have scheduled um, will be February 5th, Committee of the Whole, again at Jefferson, and we will have another meeting in February at Jefferson that will be our regular board meeting. Uh, per usual, we have more and more FOIA requests included. So you're able to see them each month. They do, uh, again, take up an inordinate amount of time uh, for Bernadette and Madeline, but we nonetheless um, work very hard to to turn those around as quickly as possible. Every now and again, we do need to um, ask for an extension because they are asking for a variety of materials to be gathered and they're not always uh, on the ready. Uh, a memo of information uh, written by Dr. Lopez is also included in uh, your board packet. It has to do with the um, every other year administration of the Illinois Youth Survey that we ask our eighth graders to participate in. It is a highly confidential um, survey process that helps us, as well as the folks at the State Board, uh, better understand youth attitudes and behaviors that can impact school success. Um, it is, again, very voluntary and, and strictly confidential. And uh, parents do have an opportunity to opt out if they are not interested in having their child participate in the Illinois Youth Survey. Parent notifications have already gone out via school messenger, and we will start the survey process, um, I believe, when we get back from break. Is that correct, Lori? Um, we actually start the survey January process yeah, the, the, at the end of January, and the survey itself is actually posted to our website if anyone <coughs> would like to see those specific questions. Okay. Uh, the next memo of information also from Dr. Lopez has to do with the continuing work of our middle school review committee. Um, we have launched uh, a middle school review committee as we've discussed with the board in the past. We are partnering with a consultant from the Association of Middle Level Educators, also known as AMLI. Uh, our consultant's name is Dr. Ann McCarthy. And this AMLI, we cannot say enough about um, how highly regarded it is with, with teachers of middle school learners. So we feel very fortunate to have a strong consultant that works for an even stronger organization helping guide our uh, committee review. You have links within your electronic board packet if you wanted to take a look at the 16 characteristics that we've reviewed, um, the we believe statements that we've created, and um, the overall work of the committee is on the web page that we created for this committee uh, process. On December 4th, the Middle School Review Committee discussed the nine overall themes that came out as a result of the thought exchange survey process. And the student focus groups. And the student focus groups, which Lori really enjoyed uh, participating in. And I don't know, Lori, if you wanted to take just a few moments to talk through those nine themes. Sure. So we had representatives, um, student representatives from both schools and all grade levels meet in grade level teams to share their thoughts with us. And specifically, we asked them, what is it that you value most about middle school? Um, talk with us about your connection to adults and how, how connected you feel it's school and then what are some other things that you'd like to see happening here at middle school that that maybe aren't happening and um, uh, you know the kids were just uh, really open and honest and had um, just a really frank 
professional conversation with the consultant about, about what it is that they value. And nine themes came out. Um, the first is that uh, all of the kids reported that middle school is a lot more challenging than fifth grade, right? especially the sixth graders. <laughs> but they all reported that middle school was a big transition for them, um, that they really wanted to have more opportunities to make new friends prior to coming to middle school and to mix with each other while they're at middle school, regardless of the team that they're on. Um, they talked about needing strategies for help with organization, which is actually right where they are developmentally, right? Because they're moving to a different schedule and a different system. Um, and so those are the skills that they're actually learning while they're in middle school. Um, all of the middle schoolers said that they could identify um, an adult that they could connect with for problem solving. The seventh graders uh, shared that they actually feel less connected to their teachers than they did in sixth grade. And we debriefed about that as a committee, and we, we thought there might be some opportunity for us to do a little bit more community, community building with seventh graders. We do a lot of that work with incoming sixth graders. Um, but our eighth graders did talk about uh, valuing that experience of looping. So we've, we wonder if seventh graders are just building new relationships with teachers and haven't cemented that yet. But that's something we were interested in, in further exploring. The students had a lot to say about how much they value the elective program and having choice within um, their school day. Um, they have lots of ideas for additional uh, electives that they would like to see. Um, but about half the students identified study hall as a potential elective choice. Um, and one of the interesting themes that came out of the parent and community thought exchange um, was the idea of a, of a balanced homework kind of, kind of piece. So, um, and the kids were sort of echoing that. So uh, one of the things that we're doing through another in-district committee, our mastery learning committee, is establishing a homework committee. And we're going to have parent representatives on that committee to help us better understand what, what homework looks like at night for families and kids. Um, the kids talked a little bit about having an advisory period. They liked the idea of that. Some of them were really supportive of, a, of something that had a, more of a social emotional component to it. And others were looking at it as an opportunity to connect with their teachers with questions about things that they don't understand. Um, and then, uh, you know, the kids reported that uh, when their classes are too far apart, that three minute passing period stresses them out. <laughs> so they want more time to be able to get to their classes. Um, but they, they did a great job um, of sharing their thoughts and ideas. And then of course we followed up with our district wide um, thought exchange survey. So parents, community members, um, and staff all participated in that thought exchange. And generally, um, uh, there were several themes that came up. The first uh, really important theme was around appreciating teachers and staff. Um, a second was that we really value and would like to update the elective curriculum. Um, a third was uh, uh, focusing on writing instruction, seeing writing as a skill that maybe needs a little bit uh, uh, more intensity at the middle school level. Um, supporting social emotional learning, which we've talked about here at the board table as well. Um, improving the parent school partnership. Um, implementing consistent discipline policies, so thinking about what our discipline policy looks like and implementing it consistently um, classroom to classroom and at the school level. And then last was, um, was sort of unrelated to, to middle school specifically, but thinking about streamlining our, our district initiatives. So we have a, a rigorous strategic plan and one of the things that we talked about as an administrative team and as a committee is um, how can we identify what the most important pieces are that are left in the plan and tackle those pieces. So uh, we're actually uh, forming a small scheduling subcommittee. And that subcommittee is going to um, be working with a scheduling um, consultant. His name is Dr. Michael Reddig from School Schedule Associates. And Dr. Reddig is a, a scheduling guru. And he's going to put together a number of different scheduling options for us to take a look at. And we'll be bringing those scheduling options back to staff and parents as well for feedback about what those look like. Um, um, we've sort of separated uh, 
these two big tasks of what should our middle school schedule look like and what should our middle school classes look like. So when you read the thought exchange comments, and we'll have a more, we'll have a more complete report by the end of January, um, there are some, and the kids' responses, there are some thoughts about updating electives. Um, we'd like, it's likely that we'll end up pulling together another subcommittee for that, and that subcommittee would include parents and community members as well. So that's where we're at with the middle Great. school review. Thank you. It's going well. Um, another few items. Hopefully you saw on December 7th, uh, an invitation went out for, uh, for neighbors and uh, parents to participate or to serve in a one-year focus group uh, surrounding social-emotional learning. And to date, I've had 13 um, interested participants submit applications. So that is going, we're gonna continue to seek um, members and I'd love to have at least 20 or so members serve on the committee. We have three meetings scheduled, uh, one in January, one in March, one in April, and we may add one in late May uh, if we need to. But we're excited to get, um, to, to provide uh, more time for dialogue as we roll out and continue <coughs> to develop what SEL is going to look like in the district. Um, lastly, it seems like a long time ago, but um, Luann and I uh, went to the Triple I conference. It's IASA, IASB, and the Illinois IASBO. Uh, Ron and I participated in a safety seminar that was a, a wonderful way to spend a Friday, and then we went through a variety of sessions, worked, uh, looked at vendor work, and we just find IIII to be a, a, a great conference. It's one in the future I hope some board members um, take advantage of and join us. And um, other than that, I just wish you, if I don't see you before the holiday break, I wish you a very uh, happy holiday, and. Um, a happy and healthy new year. Anything okay. Else? Anybody have any further comments or questions? Not hearing, uh, how about a motion to close the meeting? So uh, we'll have to take a second. second. We'll have to take a oral, Fred? Yes. Larry? Yes. Tom? Yes. 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 Okay, we're all in agreement. Thank you. Have a have a good Christmas holiday. All right. All holidays. Mm -hmm.